This is the continuation uh, of a two day meeting. So we are now reconvening the second day of this uh, board meeting. I'd like the record to reflect that the board uh, reconvened with all members present who were in attendance yesterday with the exception of uh, Director Assembly Member Juan Arambula. We have multiple agenda items today related to the Bakersfield Palmdale section and the final EIR EIS. We're going to start with agenda item number five, which will provide staff an opportunity to address the issues raised yesterday in public comments after the staff's presentation of agenda item number two. In addition, staff will also respond to the questions asked by the board before the recess. With that, uh, good morning members and good morning ladies and gentlemen and staff members. We are now ready to begin and uh, so we'll turn it over to Mr. Simon and Mr. Stanich. Good morning guys. Good morning, Chairman Richards and members of the board. Um, again, this is Serge Stanich, Director of Environmental Services with the California IQ Rail Authority. Uh, can we pull up the presentation, please? <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, we'll go ahead and advance to the next slide. So yesterday during uh, the public comment period and afterwards with the board members discussing and identifying uh, issues for additional detail, um, the team pulled together uh, this presentation to address uh, the comments and we've organized it into four categories where we, we will be presenting on this morning. The first is to address generally uh, level of design detail and how we advance the environmental documents and questions regarding mitigation measures. Uh, then we'll go into a discussion regarding the effects at Cal Portland, um, some discussion of the biological resources, and then environmental justice and community impacts. So can we advance to the next slide, please? So first off, we'll talk a little bit about the level of design detail. So go right into the next slide, please. <clears throat> The authority uh, in 2013, I believe, developed a technical memorandum that we identify as project engineering for project definition. Um, uh, this allows us to develop, and it's based on roughly a 15% design to identify a sufficient horizontal and vertical footprint for uh, evaluation of the, the alternatives. Uh, this allows us to understand the, the range of the effects and identify what the project effects would be for the various resources that we discussed uh, yesterday. Um, and it also uh, allows us to identify what the right-of-way needs would be, so the community impacts and property takes, uh, and then also helps us to identify a reasonable estimate of the project costs. This PEPD, um, and it's just a correction, it's preliminary engineering for project definition, we'll correct that in the slide, is what we use, the 15% as the basis of design for the environmental document. Once we approve the environmental document, we can then advance to more uh, advanced design that allows us to refine the footprint um, and, and focus on the, the issues that may be of, of additional concern. So we'll uh, expand the analysis for geotechnical, uh, do detailed right-of-way surveys, and then that'll allow us to initiate negotiations with third parties to begin discussions with uh, utilities, um, local governments, uh, that are freight railroad partners, uh, as well as businesses and landowners and environmental permits. So as we advance design, we can then secure these permits, but the preliminary engineering for project definition allows us to identify what the sufficient impact is for the environmental document. Can we go to the next slide, please? There was also a question regarding mitigation measures. If we identify a mitigation measure as we advance, uh, can we change it? The concern being we may have mitigation measures now that are conservative and expensive, so can we change them in the future? The answer is yes. However, uh, it's important to note that the, the environmental document and the, the approval documents, the findings of fact, the resolutions, these are binding documents. So as we advance the design and we improve our understanding of what the 
um, project impacts may be, and we were fine that if we identify a mitigation measure that may be superior, the first step that we we would do would be to do a re-exam. The re-exam evaluates the changes in the project uh, or the changes in the mitigation measure, uh, and if they're consistent with the original document. If we identify a change that would be substantial, would increase the severity of the impact, or or have uh, significant ramifications to the public's understanding of the board's decision making or the authority's decision making, uh, we can then do a supplemental environmental document. But we would do this in a transparent manner. Um, um, and we'll also note that as we advance design, many of these mitigation measures are also then incorporated into our environmental permits with the regulatory partners. So can we advance to the next slide, please? So at this point, I'll hand the presentation over to Rick Simon to talk about the effects with Cal Portland. Okay, hey, thanks, Serge. Uh, good morning, board members. Um, at the board meeting yesterday, we received uh, detailed comment letters uh, from Cal Portland and additional comment at the board meeting from a couple of representatives of Cal Portland and three comment letters from elected officials expressing concerns about uh, their mining activities and our impacts on those. We've uh, reviewed these documents, uh, discussed this with our safety and technical experts. We have not identified anything that undermines our analysis that's in the environmental document or would prevent the board from approving the project today. Next slide. We have met with Cal Portland numerous times, I, th I think at least eight in total. Uh, these last two meetings we had were after the release of the draft. Uh, to discuss the comments that they'd expressed in their comment letter on the draft. And we have uh, worked to minimize our impacts on, their, on both their current and their future mining operations. Next slide. We put together this map. Uh, one of the comments that was made yesterday was that they were requesting that we look at an alignment that avoids their property. So this map shows the salmon colored parcels uh, are parcels that are owned by Cal Portland. You can see they have fair, quite extensive land holdings on the south slope of the Atachee Mountains. You see the Garlock Fault uh, going across in the um, red crosshatch boundary. Uh, so in that area, as we cross that fault, we need to be above ground. The green dots represent wind turbines. So you can see there are a lot of wind turbines in this area. During the alternatives analysis phase, we looked at alignments that were east of Cal Portland. But those alignments had significant impacts to dozens and dozens of the wind turbines, in addition to the communities of Mojave and Roseman. We determined at that point that an alignment farther east was, was not feasible. You can see this map, if we try to look at an alignment farther west, go around the west side of Cal Portland's properties, it would throw us into an area where the mountains are much wider. We would have much more extensive tunneling and we would be coming into Tehachapi more from the south and have much more impacts on the community of Tehachapi. So we don't feel that an alignment west of Cal Portland's property is feasible either. So the alignment, that goes through, and I, I should also mention on this map, I forgot to mention that the black polygons that are shown within the Cal Portland properties, those denote the limits of their pits. Uh, the three that are east of our alignment are uh, active pits that they're currently mining. <clears throat> the two that are to the west are future pits. They've not started yet mining, but each of all of these pits in this configuration has been permitted by Cal Portland. Um, so this is the plan that they are moving forward with in terms of their operations of their facility. If we go to the next slide, we kind of zoom in on our alignment and how it goes through their property and how we are in relation to the pits. So you can see, again, the pits are the outline in black. And obviously the purpose here was to draw an alignment that would go between these pits. There's a, there's a vein of limestone in the mountains here but there are gaps between within that vein between the hills. And that's what we were aiming for. We actually worked with Cal Portland. They helped us draw these alignments so that we could try to squeeze through these openings between the pits and minimize 
our impacts on their operations. So when you, when you look at this and you apply the blasting exclusion zone that <clears throat> we talked about yesterday, the, the amount of uh, impact on these pits, it's really an edge effect. And in relation to the totality of the resources that are here, our, our impacts are, are a small percentage of, of what they have here. Go to the next slide. And I guess just to summarize those two maps, and you know, I think the, the end result is we, we see that it's really not feasible for us to go around their property on either side. And as we go through it, we believe we have the best alignment that goes through there and minimizes our impacts as much as possible. One of the comments that Cal Portland made was uh, related to fly rock. This is the potential for rock to come out of the pit as they do a, uh, do a blasting operation. There's documented case of fly rock traveling as much as 1200 feet and, and striking somebody causing property damage or injury. Um, obviously we don't want that to happen. They've asked us to provide a safety zone of 1500 feet uh, as a fly rock zone. Um, so we have looked at that and we, we have a portion of our alignment that is uh, out of tunnel and open to the air that's within that. So we are planning to provide some type of cover over that. The exact design of that will be uh, worked out detailed during final design, but we do intend to provide a shielding, a cover uh, to mitigate this uh, fly rock risk. And we believe we've addressed that concern through the design change that we made uh, at, between draft and final. Next slide, please. Next topic is the blasting exclusion zone. So this would be after we construct our tunnels where we're underground, uh, where there might be blasting activity in close proximity to the tunnels, we wanna establish an exclusion zone where we limit uh, blasting uh, too close to our tunnels. Uh, we did an analysis, uh, developed two technical reports uh, on our team, and the titles of those reports are shown here. We established the distance of 220 feet. You should note that those reports were developed based on the best information we have available at the time, uh, based on reasonable assumptions that we could make. But we were not able to obtain uh, specific uh, geotechnical data from Cal Portland. Uh, so a lot of assumptions were, were, were made to come up with the dimension that we have of 220 feet. Cal Portland is indicating that this dimension should be greater uh, uh, in the neighborhood of 600 feet. Next slide, please. So this distance is a, is a very complex detailed calculation based on a lot of factors. Uh, the size of the blasting charge, the rock conditions between the blast and the tunnel, uh, the acceptable uh, peak particle velocities that would be experienced by the tunnel by the tunnel structure and also by the passengers on the trains as they go through the tunnels. There are a lot of factors that go into this and we intend to do more detailed analysis post rod. I should also mention that we have, a, a, there's a safety process that we go through um, working closely with FRA. Uh, we will be developing a safety case and getting their review and their buy off on this. So we will not uh, ha have an unsafe project. We will be working with our partners, uh, both with Cal Portland and FRA, making sure we have a project that is safe. At the end of the day, we, 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 the environmental document calls out 220 feet, that final distance may be more, could even be less. Um, revising that distance will affect the project cost, but this will basically be part of a the right away property negotiations with Cal Portland to establish the final dimension and uh, determine the appropriate compensation uh, for the effects on their mineral resources. Next slide, please. I touched on, on the safety case. This is an important uh, thing to understand. We go through an extensive process with FRA uh, multiple approval steps as we do it through final design and even into construction and then pre-operations. We will be submitting a safety case to FRA that will give us comments. We'll do more design 
It's an iterative process, multiple submittals, and this extends even beyond construction. We would construct the tunnels, they'll do testing at that point, and, uh, and eventually get final sign off from FRA as a certificate to allow us to operate the train systems. So this process ensures, it's a very rigorous process with a lot of oversight. And this ensures that at the end of the day, we will have a safe project as we go into operations. Next slide, please. So we will have some impacts on the mineral resources. We've tried to minimize it as much as possible by going between the pits. Uh, but even using Cal Portland's own numbers, they've stated that they have 200 years worth of limestone reserves in the mountains with all the properties that they own there. The amount that we would take away from that is a very small percentage of that. Um, and I'm not gonna read these two paragraphs, but you can see from the numbers here that uh, just in terms of percentage basis in relationship to the total resources that are there, our impacts are a very small percentage. Next slide, please. I can also note that we talk about a blasting exclusion zone. That means we would not want to have blasting within close proximity of the tunnel. It does not necessarily mean that that material can still not be mined. Uh, it could be mined with non-blasting techniques, conventional mining equipment. Cal Portland has said that that is not economical for them to mine that way, that blasting is more efficient. And uh, so that's, we understand that, but uh, you know, it's possible that future technology may allow that non-blasting mining techniques could be developed that would still allow them to, then to access all that material much closer to our tunnels. So again, in summary, we, we feel we have minimized the impacts as much as possible. Um, the alignment is in the best place that it can be. Um, and we, we are committed to continuing to work with Cal Portland post-ROD to work through these issues and come up with uh, the best solution. And through the right-of-way negotiation, we'll be working with them on establishing appropriate compensation for our impacts on their operations. Next slide, and I think that concludes the Cal Portland part, and I'll give it back to Serge to talk about biological resources. Thank you. Can we advance to the next slide, please? So yesterday we heard a number of comments from the public and from the board uh, regarding the effects of biological resources. Um, and we received a number of letters over the last uh, 48 hours. Uh, and so just wanted to acknowledge that uh, representatives from the Nature Conservancy, Center for Biological Diversity, Center for Large Landscape Conservation, and SE Wildlands recently submitted several comments related to biological resources. Kara Lacey from the Nature Conservancy, JP Rose from the Center for Biological Diversity, and Christine Penrod from SE Wildlands also commented during the board. Our staff, the authority staff, along with our technical experts, has carefully reviewed all the documents and comments and has not identified anything that undermines the analysis or would prevent the board from approving the project today. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I want to uh, expand on the scientific basis that we conducted to evaluate wildlife movement and then how we work to protect that with our crossing structures or our design. So uh, our team used GIS, Geographic Information Systems, to develop uh, an, a map identifying with multiple model species, including mountain lion, mule deer, American badger, western gray squirrel, San Joaquin kit, fox, blunt-nosed leopard lizard, and Tipton kangaroo rat, areas that would be preferential or primary habitat corridor areas that they would use. In GIS, they use a, a data analysis element that refers to cost rasters, and the raster is essentially a data point that's made of land cover, road density, elevation, and topographic position. And so what we develop is a map that identifies preferential areas uh, based on en energy expenditure. So uh, along this map, you'll see that there's a dark blue hatching that is the, um, uh, I think it's the mountain line. I've got to check my color code here. Uh, pardon me, yellow is mountain line and blue is the mule deer. 
And this is the area that would be the preferential movement corridor for these two species. And you'll know in the alignment, this is an area where we have tunnel. That's the dark purple hatching for the alignment. And so we see this as an area where we essentially provided perfect permeability for, 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 pardon me, by providing the alignment to go underground in this area. So we would not be impacting mountain lion or mule deer movement in this area. Elsewhere, we evaluated badger and kit fox. And if we can advance to the next slide, I'll elaborate on that. So we talk about permeability. There was comments made that about 75%, um, and we calculated 74%, but uh, three quarters of the alignment is at, um, at grade or on embankment, which would create a barrier to movement. And so we have to understand what does that actually mean? And so we've used, or we have these two exhibits to identify how to separate 75% of embankment along the corridor. If it is one continuous block, that creates a solid area of impermeability. But if it's broken up with uh, gaps, that increases the permeability across the alignment. And that's essentially what we have along our alignment. If you look at the exhibit below, it's that same map, 75% of the 80 two mile corridor is at embankment, but each of the green arrows represents a crossing opportunity with either the tunnels or the viaducts. So you begin to see that even with the uh, alignment at embankment, we have quite a bit of permeability along the alignment. So if we can go to the next slide. We then evaluate with the project, what happens to movement, even where we have areas of embankment. So this is, um, a model that we used for Kit Fox, which is down in the valley as we are close to uh, Bakersfield. The term of art is a least cost analysis, but this is not a monetary cost. This is an energy cost with respect to the species. So red is a high energy cost where it would not be preferential by wildlife to move through. Green is a low energy, so this would be a preferential area. So in the exhibit on the left, you see the black areas. These are representative of how wildlife would move free flowing through the green areas, which are preferential. However, when we add our project and we have an area of embankment, you see how wildlife are then forced to move around that embankment. And we have a hot spot, a red, a newly identified red area that's identified as a hot spot that increases the energy cost as wildlife has to move around it. Can we go to the next slide, please? So this is how we incorporated the additional wildlife crossing structures. So this is a, the same exhibit. We're talking about San Joaquin Kit Fox. The area in red to the left is a high cost movement area as we're in the urban parts of Bakersfield. Green are the open uh, areas that are preferential for habitat. And we have three uh, plates. The first one on the left is the pre-project conditions. The second one would be the with project conditions. And you'll see that with project in this area of embankment, we've identified the hot spot, which would be a gap in the, or a barrier to movement. So in this location, we've incorporated crossing structures to thereby improve the wildlife movement. And so this is how we identify the areas that would benefit from wildlife crossing structures. The next slide, please. We also did this analysis in a graph manner. So this graph represents the same uh, GIS data that we just showed with the, the hotspot map. The area to the left is the low, um, uh, the high cost area. This is the area where it would be the, the least preferable. As you move to the right and we get into the open areas of habitat that are preferential, you'll see how we have the existing corridor, which is blue. Um, pre-project conditions. When we add the project alignment without crossings, we have uh, this drop in permeability. These red lines correlate to the hotspots that we showed in the previous exhibit. So when we add crossing structures, we then mitigate for the movement there, and then we can restore it to near pre-project conditions. Can we move to the next slide, please? We did a similar level of analysis for mountain lion. Here, it's uh, the same concept. We have pre-project conditions on the left with project conditions in the center and then with mitigation on the right. And so the best uh, observable area is on the, of the three insets in each panel, the one that's on the top left. 
you'll see we have generally green, uh, high preference, low energy cost corridors there. When we add the embankment, we have an area that turns red. That's the hot spot. So we add a crossing structure and we can then um, uh, provide the permeability and then reduce the energy costs. So we're increasing the permeability with these structures. So go to the next slide, please. This again is the graphical representation of the data that we showed in the GIS map. Each of the red bars represents an area or the, the red lines where we drop is where embankment would compromise the permeability um, from pre-project conditions when we, when we construct the project. By then adding crossing structures, we move to the green line where we can dramatically improve. It's not the same as pre-project conditions, but we can dramatically improve the with project conditions when we add the mitigations and more closely emulate the pre-project conditions. And so we still have some areas where we're unable to match pre-project conditions. And these are limitations with um, the topography. Um, however, with the analysis that we've done, we've been able to dramatically improve the with project conditions. And so um, we've incorporated sufficient mitigation that we don't believe we have a substantial adverse modification here with these improvements. Next slide, please. So as we add the crossing structures, we then provided targeted uh, crossing intervals. So we add crossing structures, small ones that are about six feet culverts, uh, box culverts every third of a mile. We also add large crossings. This could be a 20 foot culvert or one of those dual use crossings or a road with a, a, a bench adjacent that provides habitat. The length is typically around 200 feet or less. That's the crossing width of our alignment. We keep the slope relatively flat with a natural substrate and structure. So that way it's inviting and appears natural to the wildlife that are moving. And we keep it at grade so that as they approach the uh, project, the corridor, they can see a clear pathway to the other side. So on the bottom, we have this proposed or the schematic that shows the embankment with the green arrows above it representing the existing tunnels and viaducts that are part of the construction. And then we also add the blue arrows, which are the dedicated wildlife crossing structures. And so you'll see that in the combination of tunnels, viaducts, and crossing structures, we're able to provide a dramatic return to permeability. Now there's a big uh, block to the right that doesn't have any crossing structures. This is the area as we enter downtown Lancaster and Palmdale that are highly urban and don't represent a preferential path for any of the wildlife. So as part of the discussion yesterday, we talked about working with the wildlife agencies and with wildlife stakeholders. We've also included in the board resolution a commitment to continue our coordination. So we believe in our environmental document and our analysis that we have a robust analysis. We've identified the potential impacts and we've concluded mitigation to make those impacts less than significant. We're also dedicated to working with all of our wildlife interested stakeholders and agencies and we'll continue to do so after the rod so that we can refine the design and improve it uh, as we advance towards construction. So the next slide, please. We heard some comments on Joshua tree. Joshua tree was listed as a candidate species last year, but it was also a species that we had already considered in the draft document. So we have provisions in the final EIR EIS uh, for protection of Joshua tree as a candidate species, but also as a a uh, protected tree in a protected vegetation community. Uh, so we have mitigation measures, including for pre-construction surveys, on-site and off-site habitat preservation or restoration and preservation of protected trees. Uh, we'll also uh, try to minimize effects to Joshua tree through site design. And then where we can't avoid the impacts, we can salvage, transplant, and then compensate at minimum ratios. And we have one to one, but we also have three to one uh, where we considered it as a, um, a community uh, that is protected. Next slide, please. Uh, this comment came up uh, in public uh, comment period yesterday. We have an area along the corridor, along SR 58, 
where we'll be disposing potentially of spoil from the tunnel excavation at the Cesar Chavez. So through that design refinement, we identified some um, material uh, that would need to be disposed of. So we identified a potential um, uh, location uh, where we would actually clear the area, dispose of the material, and then recontour it and restore it. This is an impact, but we identified it as an area that we could restore and return to essentially natural habitat conditions. Can we advance to the next slide, Eric, please? Um, by doing so, we would minimize the truck haul trips and vehicle emissions. And so uh, as part of CEQA, we need to consider the totality of the project and all the potential impacts. And so we had to identify a location for disposal of this. However, the authority has been coordinating with Caltrans and the Kern County COG. And we believe that there will be opportunities to actually use this spoil material as far with some of the improvements that are planned for these uh, highway and road corridors. So there is um, uh, probability that we may not need to dispose of this material at this location. And that would be our preference that we could actually do a, a beneficial reuse of this material if we can consider this as an early activity or coordination with our, our partners. Uh, but want to emphasize that we have a number of mitigation measures for this area that would include recontouring it and revegetating it so that it does return to a natural area that could be used by wildlife. Next slide, please. So let's uh, uh, spend some time. I'd like to talk about community and environmental justice effects. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we received a lot of comments from uh, board members on this and want to try to touch on the, the various questions that were raised. Um, the project will have displacements in the urban areas, um, particularly in Lancaster and Palmdale. We were asked uh, not just how many residences, but how many families are we re relocating. So I uh, committed to providing some additional detail. Pardon me. East Base, Bakersfield, approximately 41 residences, 195 businesses. Edison, two residences. In Lancaster and Palmdale, where we have the, the majority of the effects, we have 203 residential households or residential relocations in Lancaster with 188 businesses. Palmdale, 312 residences and 196 businesses. At this point, we don't have actual family or uh, individual identifiers. We don't know how many families. Uh, we use census data to estimate what the populations are. So these are the estimates regarding household size for these communities that we receive, we obtained from census data. Can we go to the next slide? So, um, uh, so let's see, uh, we have business displacements. We also wanted to provide the data for not just the environmental justice locations, but also just corridor wide. Um, and so we do have some displacements into Hatchby and then in Rosemond as well. Uh, so this is the totality of the business displacements. Do we have another slide on residential? Perfect. Um, and so this is the residential. So these correspond to the numbers that we just depicted with respect to environmental justice, but um, relocations are such a, a profound effect of the project and how they affect these communities. And so we wanted to acknowledge that um, the totality of the effect here. And as we move to the next slide, um, I'm going to ask an associate of ours, Aaron Edelman, who is with our relocation or our uh, right of way group to expand. The, the board asked us, after you, know, you identify potential relocations, how are we serving right. these communities? How are we serving these uh, individuals and businesses, these families that'll be relocated? So we've asked Karen to, to elaborate to provide a detailed response on, on that. Karen? Thank you. Good morning, members of the board. Um, my name's Karen Edelman. I do relocation advisory assistance and planning. Um, and I serve on the appeals board for the High Speed Rail Authority. So um, thank you for letting me present to you today. What we heard uh, from the board was that you're very interested in making sure that we are engaging and assisting anyone who's impacted by the project um, as far as being required to move in the future. And so I wanted to ex explain a little bit about our relocation assistance program and um, see if you have any questions about that. But already the board has some amazing tools um, to address the needs of persons who are on property that are uh, 
being acquired by the project. And the first is the Uniform Relocation Act. And the second is the California Relocation Assistance Law. And those are um, the laws and um, supporting regulations that we follow to make sure that we're there to provide the assistance required. Um, and they're pretty thorough. The goal is to, uh, when Congress established this in 1970, was to make sure that there really was assistance available to people. And the first um, level of assistance in that was that we needed to plan appropriately for projects and take into consideration any special concerns um, any occupants have and address those and try and plan ahead for those. Um, the second is a relocation advisor. So um, we'll be talking a little bit about that. There's no monetary assistance attached to the relocation advisor. The advisor's role really is to stand in the middle and to provide all the assistance that um, is available and um, make sure we walk occupants through that process. So the relocation planning and community engagement, um, that is mandated. And um, it's also um, that the, the board has stepped that up, especially in its EJ directions to say that you really want us to engage more with the community. And specifically, those are targeted to those who might be impacted. It's our opportunity to hear from the community and, and present the community with information about the program and project and scheduling. Um, it also gives us an opportunity to uh, introduce our relocation team and have a phone number for people to call um, and have meetings ahead of time so that they kind of understand um, what the program is and we can answer questions that they might have. It also gives us an opportunity to plan for the project um, and maybe provide additional lead time as needed to make sure that um, all businesses relocate successfully. One of the other things we do while we're doing the planning and engagement is to try and understand um, some of the expressed concerns um, people have about housing and um, maybe what their long-term goals are. Uh, one of the great things you'll see about our program is that we're able to help renters um, maybe become homeowners. And that's something we're happy to do. And so that helps us to engage even earlier, work with area community um, groups to have first-time homebuyer programs um, in languages that are accessible to people. Um, so it really helps us prepare people for um, for next steps in their lives. And um, they're great tools in our program in the financial uh, part of that. So relocation payments, I'll talk about that more in a moment, uh, but there's also a monetary side of providing relocation assistance. And then I also wanna talk about the authority's next level of assistance, your relocation mitigation plan. So this is where the board has said, we recognize our obligations under federal law and state law um, and our relocation program, but we really wanna do more. Um, and I would say that your relocation mitigation plan is something that pretty much captures what you've been doing in the past, but um, is even more clear with direction from the board to say, this is really our mandate. And that includes just a really high level of individualized assistance. So while that's available under relocation advisory services, what we're hearing the board say is we want you out there early. We want you to communicate with people um, in languages that they understand. We want you to hear what they're saying and help them plan for successful relocations in the future. Um, and then you have um, agency engagement and coordination. That's critical. So many of the businesses that we impact um, aren't huge corporations with um, big real estate departments. We're impacting a lot of smaller businesses. And a lot of times, um, some of those businesses don't, aren't even aware of what's available already in the community for them, let alone our program. And so part of our goal is to uh, be engaged in the community beforehand and have those resources available and be able to communicate to that the businesses and say, there's some great programs here through the Small Business Administration, through, um, through grants. Um, we also have an ability to bring in specialists who can help a business plan for its move. Um, just because the business is in 20,000 square feet, because that's how it's been and where it's grown to, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, it can't be more efficient uh, when it moves and pay less uh, for less square footage. Um, and, and because they're more efficient or the, the way the equipment set up is better. And so that's really a lot of what we do um, through community engagement and engaging with the businesses early. Um, the 
sec, that kind of talks about the considerable uh, consider additional assistance to support businesses. Some of the things that the board has done thus far is engaging with a lot of the businesses that we're impacting and hearing that they need more time, hearing that they need specialists um, and some guidance. And so we've done that. Um, we've had a lot of successes in um, working with businesses and nonprofit organizations. And I, I know the board's aware of many of those. Um, a couple of those are, you know, we relocated one of the largest um, fresh produce companies out of Fresno. And that's a great example of how the business was able to relocate and be maximally efficient and um, kind of move into the next um, era for the business and, and just really a great facility in the after condition. Um, we were able to work with um, rescue mission and, and homeless shelter and feeding. And part of that was able to identify um, a much longer lead time needed and find some really creative ways out of um, that are not typical to make sure that we find ways to support that really important service to the community. And so that was fantastic. We have small businesses um, that work out of people's homes and we were able to assist them in their relocation and just really come alongside them and try and find the best way to support them through our programs. And so that's really um, been very exciting to us. I know you all are very familiar with many of the businesses in downtown uh, Frankfurt and Fresno and um, Moscow, and uh, we're just really excited about that and um, what we've been able to do to help many of those businesses. One of the things that the board has um, asked um, and will be approving in the, if it approves a resolution is the EJ Ombudsman, and that's really a great um, role to offer to the community and say, we want a one-stop. For you, we want somebody that you can go to in the community and say, "These are our concerns, and these are issues, and I want to make sure they're being heard, and I want I want to make sure High Speed Rail is responding to that." And so, I think that that's going to be a really great tool for us to use in the future. So, we're pretty excited about that. And lastly, part of the resolution is that um, the board is asking that you know, this is great to plan it, but I want to hear back. You know, we want to hear back after relocations and find out what really happened and how things went. And so. Um, we're happy to uh, be talking with you about that in the future, what that looks like and, and when that will be. So um, that's kind of an overview of a relocation program, but I want to take a moment and talk to you about what specific benefits are um, in case you're not so familiar with that. Uh, if we can have the next slide. All right, so this slide kind of captures a very high view of what relocation assistance is. Um, and again, the, the High Speed Rail Authority's Relocation Assistance Program is aligned with the federal and state laws and regulations and uh, transportation agency uh, directives. And so let's talk about residential because there's two big broad categories. One's residential and one's non-residential. So uh, non-residentials are businesses and farms and nonprofit organizations. So let's talk about residential. Residential gets all that advisory services that we talked about beforehand, all the planning, all the coming alongside and walking people through the process. Um, a large part of that is helping them find housing and talking with people and understanding if they want to move from being a home renter to a home buyer and how we can assist with that um, through our down payment assistance program or um, listening to households that say, these are my needs. Like when I bought this house, it, you know, my needs were X and now my needs are Y and how do we address that? And what are my options? And so it's a lot of handholding and sitting with people um, in their living rooms, which has changed the last few years, but we hope that that will um, soon be resolved and we'll be able to sit in people's living rooms again and just really uh, walk with them alongside them in this process. Um, we also cover household moving costs. So we either pay a professional moving company to come in and pack and move and insure and unpack at a replacement site, uh, which is fantastic. Um, or if somebody is eager and ambitious, there we will pay them to move themselves. And um, that's an option too, which a lot of people take. And, um, and then they um, take care of the moving part themselves. One of the parts that's really exciting about um, Residential relocation is our housing payments, are called replacement housing payments. Two categories. Uh, the first is homeowner occupants. Um, a homeowner gets a purchase differential payment, which means 
this is uh, what their home is worth. And this is what it costs for them to relocate into the community. And the purchase differential payment is to cover that delta to help them move into the community. And um, next is a um, incidental expense payment. And that's about covering the closing costs um, for the new home. And then there's a mortgage interest differential payment, which we're not gonna see a lot of uh, right now uh, because there's some really low interest rates. But if that changes and uh, people move and they have to pay a higher interest rate, we will walk through that with them so that their loan doesn't cost them any more in the after condition. Um, and then there's a whole category in our lawn regs um, called uh, housing of last resort. And it's um, additional assistance as needed um, to make sure that these homes are affordable to them and um, that they are able to move from point A to point B without additional housing costs. And um, sometimes that additional assistance is my life has changed and now I need um, to make sure that the home is 100% um, accessible to a family member. And uh, we work with that and that's something that we can cover. Um, and then in addition, the additional assistance that's directed by the board is they want, you guys want an ombudsman and we want to be there um, to make sure that they have access to that ombudsman and if they have any concerns whatsoever. Um, then we have tenant relocations, and um, oftentimes that's dealing with people in apartments or hotels or um, houses, um, mobile homes. And that relocation assistance is about helping them with the increased rent costs. So again, if, um, they're paying low rent right now, and this rental assistance payment or rent differential payment is about paying the difference between what current rent is in the community and what rent they were paying. Um, so there's a delta. And we pay that delta for 42 months. Um, oftentimes, people say, oh my gosh, if you're going to give me that much money, I want to use it as a down payment to purchase replacement housing, which we're all behind. And so we really engage them in home buyer education courses and um, walking through them, with them through that and, and helping them understand what it takes to be prepared to buy a home and um, searching for sites and link them to realtors, et cetera. Again, there's that additional assistance. So the additional assistance is um, that what if there's not a lot of housing available? What do we do then? Like, how do we make sure that people have housing that they can get into and that they can afford it um, under last resort housing, under the law and regs, is that we will help them so that the home is affordable, that after they relocate, that low-income households don't have to pay more than 30% of their income for rent for 42 months. So. It really is a great program, and um, I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's very exciting to see people move from being tenants to homeowners if that's what they want to do. And so um, we're really engaged in that. Um, we also do a lot about helping people understand what people want in the future. So if these are folks that are interested in saying, you know, I really want affordable housing in the future, um, that's kind of my future housing plan, uh, then we help them assess whether eligibility is for that identify what's available in the community for them and help them apply for oftentimes wait lists for that. Um, so sometimes they use our assistance for a period of time and, and then they move on to um, affordable housing. So um, a lot of what we do as well in that planning process is to work with area communities and HCD um, to see what kind of affordable housing opportunities are available and to plan in advance so that we can do whatever we can to help people be successful in that. So let's move on to uh, non-residential occupants. So again, that's businesses, farms, and nonprofit organizations. Again, they have uh, advisory services and a dedicated relocation advisor. We walk with them through the process. We help them understand what assistance is available to them. And one of the things I tell businesses all the time is it's my job to stand in the middle between the authority and you and make sure you know everything that you're eligible to receive by law. Everything, every dime I can get you, I wanna make sure that you get. Um, and it's also my responsibility to authority is to make sure the authority understand what its obligations are um, for individual payments and, and benefits and help the authority understand why they need to pay it and what category it falls under. We help businesses with um, and nonprofit organizations to identify any needs in their relocation, like what kind of permits do you need? Do you need any special services to help plan for your move? Do you need any assistance to understand what the next chapter of your business might be and how best to um, 
to prepare for that? Are there people that can help inform those decisions with you? And then there's financial assistance. So the financial assistance is, okay, how are you going to help me financially move from point A to point B? And so the first category is actual moving expenses. And that really is a category of what does it cost to move your personal property from point A to point B? And when we say move, we don't just mean move. We mean disconnect it, move it, reconnect it, permit, recalibrate, um, provide insurance and transit. Um, if there's a foundation required for that piece of equipment, we make sure that that's covered. Um, and so these are a lot of things that businesses, um, especially small businesses, may not have thought of or heard, heard about initially. And so we really want to spend time investing in them and helping them be successful in their relocation. So um, the other category of assistance is reestablishment expenses. Um, this isn't related to moving personal property. It's about moving the business. And so this is costs such as increased operating expenses, signage, um, code required improvements to the new site. And so we help businesses um, work through that as well. So if a business is really, really small, so think, um, you know, a barber or a small insurance business or a small real estate business, they might say, you know, Karen, I don't really want to go through that whole process of applying um, and giving you details about my move, is there something else? And the something else in this case is called a payment in lieu of actual moving expenses. So it's where we say, okay, if you don't want to do receipts, et cetera, we can just look at your last two years uh, net income from the site and we can make a payment up to $40,000, which is really great. Um, and so that works really well for some businesses and other businesses um, wouldn't even take a bite out of their costs. So Again, the advisory assistance is to sit down with the businesses and say, well, let's see, let's look at both options and see what works for you. And um, so that is a really quick high level summary of the relocation assistance program that you're already offering. Um, it also talks about the enhanced assistance that the board has directed and is, has been offering and will offer in the future. So um, I'm happy to take any questions that you have, but um, that's my presentation on relocation today. Uh, Karen, uh, this is Lynn. Uh, thank you for, for that. Uh, I think uh, you very well represent what this board cares about deeply, and that is the, the community, and I've heard very good things about you. So thank you for representing our collective and our individual hearts in this matter. Uh, these projects are big, they're expensive, they're out, but Ultimately, they affect people and individuals. Yeah. I, I have uh, two. Uh, you were not on yesterday, so you didn't know what my, my question had to do with, uh, in the housing area, uh, any unresolved issues, any points of contention with any individual, either homeowners or renters, and uh, you know, how we are dealing with, with them. And two, uh, which I did not bring up yesterday, but your presentation brought up the question about the smallest of the small businesses. Uh, my mom was a manicurist in a very small shop. My dad, a tailor, had a very small tailor shop. Their customers were the neighborhood people. And if we are relocating, uh, you know, the, how do, are we helping with advertising are we how are we what are we doing to reestablish the the business base that they are losing uh, because you know twenty thousand dollars may sound like a lot but it goes real real quickly in in this right. economy and so my concern is uh, you know I, I see my mom and my dad in my mind's eye and what they would be going through emotionally if they were told that their the business that they have built up over 25 30 years, is now going to be gone. Right. Um, well, it sounds like you had two questions. So let me address yes. the residential portion first, right? So I think what you're asking is, are there any unresolved concerns from homeowners or tenants, yes. uh, residential tenants? And um, I sit on your relocation appeals board and um, we have not had, we, we don't have any pending appeals as far as I know from any residential occupants. Um, and maybe in part that's because the relocation assistance we offer residents is very robust, right? It's 
the relocation law in 1970 really was written to address the needs of residential occupants and in particular low-income occupants, right? So it's one of the reasons I like being a relocation advisor. It's a really great program. Um, so I haven't heard of any and um, I checked with uh, the appeal secretary today and said, you know, is there anything I need to know or anything happening? So um, I think the residential is going great. So I don't think we have any unresolved issues. Um, your second question was about how do we address businesses? And um, again, when, when Congress wrote the Uniform Relocation Act in 1970, um, you know, they wrote it so it addresses huge conglomerates and really small manicurists renting a station in, you know, a beauty salon. And so my role as I see it, and I think most relocation advisors feel the same way, is we approach each business owner whether they're a manicurist or a tailor or whatever, and say, okay, tell me about you. Help me to understand. Because my job is to be a specialist in the laws and regs and know how I can help. You know, your job is to run a business and you've, you know, maybe you've never moved a business before. Maybe you inherited this business or you bought it in place. You might not be ready to deal with this and tackle it. Or you could say, oh my gosh, I have so much work to do already. I can't, you know, this is a lot. So our job is to kind of hear it and boil it down find out, okay, what, what specifically is your concern and how do we work through it? And that's really where um, our expertise comes in as a relocation advisor is to hear each one and respond and try and figure out where the lawn regs fit best. Um, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that it's easy or that um, it's easy for any business owner that we deal with, right? It's just that we're coming alongside. And so we say, you're a manicurist. Okay, and you really serve this community. All right. So, you know, what could we do? Are you are you at toward, you know, are you in a place where you want to say, Karen, I only want to work, you know, two days a week and I don't want to move to that fancy schmancy salon down the street. I want maybe a small neighborhood. So what do we do with that? What what does permitting allow? How, you know, what um shop that already exists might you be able to rent from that your community might want to go to, if that makes sense. Um, and so, you know, in trying to find out, okay, what personal property do you own? How much money can we get you related to that to help you with your move? Um, is there a specialist we can bring in that could help it any better? You know, can we direct you to small business association that can even give no, you- No, I, I Karen, I understand all of that and appreciate how important that is. I'm talking about building up the business as a the, the people that these folks in the smallest businesses, whether it's a sandwich shop or a manicure right. or whatever, they they service the neighborhood they're in. And now we're going to relocate them to another neighborhood. How and maybe you don't have the answer right now. And we need to think about that. How do we help them build their business back up? Right. Well, I think there are tools and it's about listening and seeing what we can do. But you're right. I mean, I think every single one is individualized. Um, you know, we can bring in specialists to help them plan and think about it. Um, we can give them additional money to reestablish and fix up the place they're moving to. Um, we can try really hard to find great places for them. Um, there's also another component that is not under relocation lots under California state law about loss of business goodwill. So sometimes um, if it might impact a business to move, there is a, a tool that we can use to say, here's some additional assistance to help you advertise and help you get the word out and help you maybe reach out to the community and make sure that they know you're here. Um, so that's another whole other matter that um, we work with too. So, um, okay. well, anyway. I don't labor this, but I as individually anyway, at some point as this unfolds, would like to have a report on the smallest businesses that have been okay. impacted that we have not been able to help them relocate and build back their business. So okay. uh, if, if just if you make note of that as we go okay. along. That, but thank you again for everything that you do to help folks because, you know, as I said, it's a big project, but it's down to everybody's uh, heart who has to be moved. Okay. And uh, we, we want to make sure that they understand that all of us care about that. Right. And, and thank you, because it's really great to work for an organization that wants to help. Um, how you interpret and implement the laws and regs 
matters. And so thank you for providing that additional direction and support. Thank you, Director uh, Shank. Uh, Director Perea. Yes, Karen, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for that uh, presentation. Just a few questions and just maybe a few comments and or suggestions. So my first questions of the folks that you had on the initial chart that are being uh, impacted, both businesses and residences, what is the ethnic composition of that population? So I don't have that information. It's possible that someone else in the team might. Okay. I, I would suspect that it's going to be pretty heavy Latino, mm -hmm. but it, but if we could get that information, that would be helpful. And it, and it kind of goes on to uh, some other comments I want to make with respect to lessons learned in Fresno. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we had, a, 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 like anything else, when you're starting something new, you have some rough starts. And I know early on, we had a lot of... Uh, missteps when it came to dealing with property owners, both business and residential, you know, and it was a, a variety of things that were happening. Uh, we were having problems with, with continuity of the, uh, of the contractors that we were contracting with to go out into the field to make contact with property owners to talk about uh, making uh, land offers and relocation, et cetera. So, so the one issue we had for quite a long time was where folks coming in and they worked for a while with property owners and then for some reason they would leave. Mm -hmm. And then the next property agent came in and didn't have the information. So they, they had to start all over again with the property owners. And that, that created an abundance of, of issues uh, for us at the time. I was a county supervisor, and I can't tell you how many meetings I was called to, uh, especially out in our rural areas uh, for landowners who are being affected and going through a very challenging and frustrating process. And they were calling us to task to ask us how we could help them. So, right. you know, I, I hope that, that we have that issue resolved and we'll see that in, in this segment of the alignment. The, the other was, like anything else, I think when you have anything that's quasi-enforcement, or in this case, you're, you're, you're negotiating with property owners, sometimes we folks can have a heavy hand and not be flexible. And we spent a lot of time dealing with that. We had some really great teams that were out there working with people hand in hand to get to the end, and, and the other, some other folks who were just being very difficult uh, on the property owners, mm -hmm. which then we had to step in. Um, you know, I, I think I think one thing that really ended up working well is uh, at, at the end is the authority contracted or worked with our local economic development corporation. And to this day, they still have that relationship. And, and I can tell you that that we were or them working very hand in glove with the authority. Uh, we're able to retain 85 percent and relocate 85 percent of the businesses. Uh, in Fresno, so that was very successful, but uh, not, I mean, obviously I was not with the EDC, but I was at enough meetings to where, you know, if we had more continuity, we would have avoided a lot of problems. So I just, I just hope that um, as a part of what you're doing, you're, you're working with folks like Supervisor uh, Leticia Perez out of, uh, out of the Kern County Board of Supervisors and, and le other elected officials at the, at the city council levels to help you find those people on the ground in those areas that these people know and mm -hmm. will trust and can work with them. And I think that's then, if you're gonna have an ombudsman, uh, I'd like to know more, not right now, but mm -hmm. moving forward, what kind of authority that ombudsman would have in terms of their relationship with HSR and, and whoever the contract folks are that are doing the, the negotiations with folks. Because I can tell you that that person's phone is going to be ringing off the hook 24-7. Yeah. And if they don't have the authority uh, to get issues resolved for those individuals out in the community, it's going to be a problem. So I'll just those are just my, my broad comments. And uh, if you could just have staff send us information in terms of folks that are being impacted and ethnic diversity, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Director Perea. Did I see uh, Director 
Williams, did you have uh, your ha your hand up also? Yeah, initially I lowered it, but I <clears throat> virtually putting it back up because I just just wanted to pick up on that point. I think it would be important to have as part of this record um, that data and that um, overlay. I, I know we have the heat map showing the EJ communities um, that are impacted and and where we think those acquisitions are going to be needed. Um, so it would be it would be useful to to see that to see that you know some estimates along those lines um and that we you know obviously continue to um monitor this and get reporting back i i, I liked um Lynn's suggestion that we do get some report backs and i noted in the in the resolution that will be before us um that there is an ongoing responsibility to report to the board on the specifically the right of way acquisitions and the measures that will be taken to address the, the disproportionate impacts. So um, I will, you know, definitely look forward to seeing that, but I think it would be helpful now to have as part of, you know, the record of this. I mean, not, not just the fact mm -hmm. that we're talking about it now, but just see that data um, included here so that we know what we can expect when we see those future reports and how these communities are being um, taken care of. Thank you, Director Williams. Uh, all right, I don't see any others. Uh, can we go ahead and continue with the presentation now? And thank you, Ms. Edelman. So um, uh, thank you, everyone. I, I just want to follow up on this. Um, on this item, uh, appreciate Karen's update for the work that the authority has been doing in serving uh, relocations in the affected uh, communities. Um, and we, the authority staff have recognized that this is a really important issue and, and Director Williams has already touched on this, but I thought I'd just add into the discussion explicitly what the proposed resolution is. So in preparing the record of decision for the board's consideration, we, we've included specific language in the resolution. So I'll just read it out here. Um, the board directs the chief executive officer as follows in the third bullet to continue outreach to potentially affected communities and no later than two years after funding has been approved for this project section's right of way acquisitions. Report to the board on measures taken and measures proposed to avoid or address potential disproportionate effects, if any, related to property acquisitions in environmental justice communities as these communities are defined in the NEPA record of decision. So I just wanted to note, this is an issue that as we've been discussing and advancing this project section and the consideration of the effects of these communities, uh, we've included a resolution specifically to address coming back to the board on that topic. Thank you, Director Scusha. Uh, I think the only issue that concerns me is the line of quote, no later than two years. I think we have to front load the information as soon as possible to the board. I wouldn't want to get information from you, you know, at year year one, you know, 11th month. No, I, I frankly think we should get information as soon as possible. So can we change? I mean, if, if people, if the board agrees with that, can we change the language in that resolution? Board member Scusia, good morning. Um, Absolutely, the board can make changes to resolution before we move forward. Um, probably makes the most sense to finish this presentation because there's some more meaty issues for you all, and then we can we can be more specific about that um, and why the language is what it is and and what the board wants to do with it. Does that work for you, Director Scusha? I I mean I well obviously you know council is basically telling me to not talk anymore and basically save my comments at, at the appropriate time, which I will. But no, uh, not, not my intention at all, Board Member yeah, so I'm, I'm saying yes I'm, to your question, but I would propose I am just, uh, I, will, I will hold until the proper time of the discussion. No, but uh, your comment is, is recorded though uh, with what you've already said, the Director Scusia. So thank you very much. Um, all right, go ahead, please. Uh, yes, can we call up the presentation again?
So continuing on, um, one of the items discussed yesterday of particular concern for uh, the directors is the potential noise effects to these communities. So I wanted to spend some time uh, discussing uh, you know, how we analyze noise effects that might arise from the project. So we use the FTA's uh, guidance to, to measure noise effects. And we establish it's based on a sliding scale. So I'll, I'll work through the exhibit here. Um, the existing noise level. So we, we go out and, um, and do uh, noise analyses. We take sound reading noise readings in each of the communities that we're going to affect to determine what the ambient noise levels are. Because this has a perception of what increased noise might do as far as annoyance or disturbance. So if you live in a particularly rural or um, non-urban area, you have a very low ambient noise level. If you live in a highly urban area, you have a much higher ambient noise level. So a train passing will have a very different experienced effect if you're in a, a rural area versus an urban area. So we conduct ambient noise measurements. So we identify what the baseline is, and then we uh, model what the uh, noise uh, effects of the project would be. And so if we increase, as you'll see, depending on where you live, an increase of uh, five to 10 decibels will have a different effect and it can be a moderate or severe impact. So that's how we identify in the various communities what the, the impacts might be. And as part of our analysis, we've conducted a conservative analysis. It's not a worst case scenario, but we conduct an, a, a conservative analysis based on what the anticipated noise effects would be a train um, traveling at 220 miles an hour through the full alignment at peak. So when it's at full build out. And so it has a, a, a dramatic increase on the perceived noise effect, but that's how we conduct our modeling just to determine what the potential effects would be. So next slide, please. Once we've identified how certain communities could be affected, and we have different classes, um, if it's a school, it'd be class one or residential. These are highly sensitive receptors. Public parks or other areas would be considered less sensitive. But we have a three-tier process regarding how we would mitigate noise. The first one is a sound barrier. So if a community would experience a severe effect um, and it's highly urban where we have a lot of uh, potentially or sensitive receptors, we incorporate a sound barrier. The next level of mitigation would be sound and insulation. And this goes directly to the homes where we would modify the homes, either the windows or the doors to provide sound insulation. And if we're unable to uh, mitigate with sound insulation, we may also consider noise easements where uh, owners of those residences who experience this noise could be compensated for, um, for the effects of the noise. Um, as we advance and we progress through our advanced design, but before we go to final construction, before we go to operation, we have another mitigation to essentially true up the analysis. That way, as we advance design, better technology becomes available. We can determine in working with the local communities what the effects would be and what the appropriate final design mitigation should be for sound. Um, we've also included an equity analysis to make sure that the application of the noise mitigation is going to be equitable for the EJ communities as it is for the non-EJ communities. Um, and then also we're considering as part of our procurement to ensure that we have um, uh, trains that meet the best standards for noise while still meeting some of our upper, other operational requirements for travel time. The next slide, please. So here are a few of the noise mitigation. We have, um, as I said, through design, we can incorporate the sound barriers to determine where they're needed. We have vehicle specifications regarding the, the rolling stock that will be identified and then insulation. We, may, we will also have some construction noise. And so we have limitations and best management practices to reduce construction noise, uh, limitation of the night time and, and uh, routing traffic to avoid quiet communities. And then there's also a discussion regarding operations. Part of the problem with noise during operations is essentially a maintenance issue. So we wanna make sure that we're maintaining and providing real, real grinding as necessary to minimize potential noise. Next slide, please. 
So I was asked regarding where are these sound walls located. So here is an exhibit where uh, the sound walls would be uh, included for Bakersfield. And as this is a highly urban area, uh, we have the, the noise walls incorporated throughout this area where the um, uh, sensitive receptors and <clears throat> noise mitigation guidelines would uh, establish for that. So the, the difference between the blue and the yellow is where it was evaluated for the Bakersfield locally generated alternative that stops at Oswell Street. And then the yellow are the sound walls that are proposed as the uh, Bakersfield and Palmdale noise mitigation. We will still have ultimately some residual um, severe impacts, but this is where the authority continues to commit to uh, resolving these issues as we advance design to obtain or achieve the best technology and mitigate noise uh, as we, we advance the project. Serge, I have a question for you. Please. Yeah. On your first slide, you, you, you've been, this whole presentation or this part of the presentation is based on a, the full phase one build up, I believe it said. But my question <clears throat> is this, these studies, were they based on a dual track or single track impacts? Or does that make a difference in this analysis? Uh, I have to confirm that. I'm gonna you know, have my staff confirm that, but my, Rick, do you wanna answer that one? It, the design is based on double track. This yep. whole section is analyzed as being double track. Great, thank you. Thank you, Rick. Uh, can we advance to the next slide, please? There was also a question on mitigation, uh, or pardon me, uh, vibration. Uh, the project will potentially result in some vibration uh, as part of construction and operations. We have a number of mitigation measures that we are proposing to incorporate regarding maintenance, um, vehicle suspension, uh, building modifications, operational modifications, and buffer zones. With the applications of the mitigation measures, I won't read them. These are the ones that are included um, in the document. We do not anticipate any uh, significant uh, impacts uh, from vibration uh, to sensitive receptors as part of the project when, after mitigation. So the next slide, please. Uh, also touching on a few details that we were questioned, um, regarding Edison Middle School, this is an area that um, through our alternative selection, we moved the preferred alternative, alternative two, even further away. So the Edison Middle School will not experience any operational noise or vibration impacts. There is some potential for uh, noise and vibration impacts, uh, construction noise, but with the mitigation measures, we anticipate those to be uh, less than significant. Less than significant. Um, there will still be some uh, visual impacts with the introduction of the viaduct in this location. Next slide, please. Can I ask a question, please? Please. Go ahead. Yeah. Go when you talk about the vibration, vibration causes cracks on buildings, and that do we uh, warranty anything for any length of time in terms of repairing those types of cracks if in fact they occur? Um, I'll have to uh, consult. I don't know how we provide that. Our, our our analysis identifies where potentially vibration sensitive structures exist. Um, and so we have protection measures for those, whether they're historic or um, uh, maybe sensitive to another, um, due to another issue. And so we've provided for that in our analysis, um, but regarding some sort of subsequent compensation, I believe ultimately, you know, we would have the liability, but I would have to confer with, um, with others regarding what our commitments are there. I thought that, that some of the questions that were gonna be, that were asked yesterday would be answered today. So you've done nothing in terms of repeating basically what you've said yesterday, because you've done no more, there's no more mitigation that you are coming up with relative to the problems that we're referring to. Uh, we, we have not developed new mitigation from what's proposed in the environmental document as we believe what's in the environmental document satisfies our requirements under CEQA and NEPA. And so the intent here was to provide greater clarity as to some of the questions as to 
how we evaluated the impacts, how we incorporated the mitigation measures. Sir, can I make, um, Please. A, a prior slide actually discusses the specific visual mitigation measures that we have. These are supposed to be examples. Um, if you can go to that prior slide. Uh, before this. Um, so these are uh, these are mitigation specific to vibration. Uh, Director, um, I think it was Director Camacho, is your question on visual mitigation measures or on vibration mitigation measures? Vibration mitigation measures. These are specific, and these are um, these are the um, commitments and procedures that are identified in our document um, for uh, mitigation commitments on vibration. Well, on that issue, if I may, Council, uh, uh, on page forty of the slides on the buffer zones, it says negotiate a vibration easement from the affected property owners or expand the rail right of way. What's a vibration easement? Can, can you just explain to me, you know, what is it that you're really going to be negotiating with the property owners? So I can explain in general what a vibration easement is. Um, the specifics would be, I would have to defer to our, our vibration technical experts. But in general, um, it means that if a property is affected by, by vibration, um, we can offer to compensate that property owner uh, for um, the diminution um, the effect of uh, the vibration on, on their property. So we would uh, propose a payment and it would uh, then, the payment would be in exchange for, for a, a servitude, which identifies um, that this particular property is affected by vibration. Okay, my next question is probably best addressed to Serge, you know, because we're getting here a lot of um, charts and slides of, of, of a lot of um, options that, that, that high-speed rail has in order to minimize uh, environmental impacts, whether it be sound, whether it be vibration, or even relocation. Are you saying that when we vote on this resolution, all of these potential solutions are going to be on the table? They're going to be available to the impacted population? I, I, I would hope that it is, you know, because I don't want to vote on something that's a very minimal um, menu as to what's available to the impacted population. I, I would hope that this agency stands for the principle that we are going to provide um, as robust as possible of um, mitigation efforts to small businesses, to impacted homeown homeowners, as well as to wildlife. So obviously I, you know, I would hope that when we start discussing the actual word for word of the whereas, whereas, whereas of the resolution, that we're very aware as board members that what we are voting for now is going to impact the remedies available to impacted populations in the future. So that question was to me, and yes, these mitigations are all included in the environmental document as commitments that are then binding in the mitigation monitoring and enforcement plan. So when you vote on this and provide um, the resolutions that include directions to the CEO and the authority staff, it is the direction to us to, to implement these measures. And as our colleague Karen talked about, there is a, a long process that we work with affected uh, um, residents or landowners, business owners, to work with them um, through the process to identify what the best solution is for them. So this is uh, it, it. These is a this is a suite of mitigations that we work with to identify the best solutions, and they are broad. And I'll add one last point: they're broad because different individuals, different businesses, different buildings will experience different um, effects. And so we need a broad document that includes a suite or a menu of options so that we can assist uh, each affected party uh, appropriately. Thank you, Serge, for your clarification. It makes me feel better. I trust you. Um, and also um, uh, let the record reflect. I hope that the record does reflect what Serge just said right now. I know it's being recorded, but I really want to underscore that this has got to be really, really put into the record. Thank you so much, Serge.
Thank, Thank you, you, Director Escucha. Uh, yeah, and Mr. Chair, Director Mr. Chair, if I could, yeah, Director if I could jump in real quick, I just, I just wanted to, just because I just, I'm maybe intentionally a little dense here because I wanted to be crystal clear. I think what you heard yesterday and the questions of what you're hearing today in our conversations are, we are approving an environmental document that assumes that mitigation is needed based on what we know today in terms of the acquisition, construction, and operation of, of uh, the, the system through here. What I think what you're getting is we want assurances that as we know more, we are continuing, we have a continuing obligation as an authority to address issues as they come up. So we think we know what our technology is gonna be when we do the construction. We think we know what we're gonna be doing, how, the, how these trains are gonna be operating through these communities and how they're gonna be impacting these communities and wildlife for that matter. So, but we won't know until we actually do know. And when we, what, what I want here is crystal clarity that we will have an ongoing system of monitoring these impacts and having an ongoing obligation to mitigate these impacts in a fair and equitable way throughout the operation of the system. Is that what you're saying? That is, let me just leave it at that. Is that what we are hearing? Yes, we are committing to that in our environmental document through various provisions uh, to revisit the design before we finalize it, to commit to going out to these communities, to working with uh, affected uh, residents and, and uh, municipalities um, to finesse the design as we advance it to be um, the best optimal implementation of the project. Uh, I, uh, I see that Min Ming wants to step in. I always kind of invite counsel when uh, I'm speaking in case I might be um, uh, saying anything that uh, should be monitored. But please, Min Ming, do you want to add something? No, I'm not monitoring what you're saying. I, I just actually wanted to add um, that in the mitigation monitoring and enforcement plan that is an attachment C of the rod in your board packet, there is a, a schedule of um, t uh, and a time frame of when we must um, finish, uh, when we must commit, and when we must undertake these measures, including when we must report out. So for example, with relocation, which is um, the EPA mitigation relocation measure, the reporting schedule is we must report out before acquisitions. I, I hope Anthony, that, but, uh, but, but I, th I think Director Williams was talking about this is now, but what happens in the future? Anthony. And, and, and what do we do in the future? And I'm so glad to see Brian. Hi, Brian. Yeah. Hi. Because I, I want to right. hear from you, Brian, what are the commitments good. that you're making? Good, good, because I'd like to weigh in on this. Anthony, you've asked a very good question, and it's an important question about what's before you today with this snapshot in time. And right. that, that this document reflects all of our known issues in our definition of the project and what we're doing and how... And, and informing the public and stakeholders and the board and everybody about what the project is, what the project impacts are, and what we're doing about it. This is a lifetime commitment for this authority. In other words, we have to get through this based on what we know now. But you are right. Over the course of operations of this program, we have a lifetime commitment with the communities that we go through. And so the point is, as new things come up and as new data materializes when we are advanced in this project well beyond what we know today, we have a lifetime commitment to work with the communities and the impacted parties of what we do well into operations. And, 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 and I am hearing clearly the ethic of this board, which I think is totally right, and this administration, that we have a commitment to work with those communities, uh, localities, all the way through this process. As we learn more, it's dynamic, it's a dynamic world, and we have to adjust to those things and make modifications as we go forward. And so certainly, you know, this is what we know today. 
Uh, we are laying out what these what we know. We've done unbelievable analysis. This has been an 11 year process just on what we know today. We are informing the public what that is, what our impacts are, and what our mitigation strategies are to those impacts. But I think you're getting at a more important issue, which is that operating this system is a lifetime. I mean, this is, goes on for a long time. And, and the relationships we have with uh, parties that we affect and the communities we affect is an ongoing commitment from this authority to work well with those agencies and make sure that we have good relations and that we're responsive to the communities we go through. And that is an ethic of this board and it's a commitment of this staff. Thank you, Director Carrasco. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I'm glad I heard uh, Ryan speak because I own three commercial buildings near uh, a track work system. And we have, uh, we're, we're, we're seeing a great deal of cracking uh, at least on one of the three buildings, which happens to be for sale, which I'm in, I sold, actually I sold and, and had to go back into litigation with the railroad and we were able to, uh, to extract some dollars for those things. But I'm just saying, I wanna be sure that we have language clear that uh, whoever owns those facilities, if in fact those cracks are occurring because of the train, then we need to do something about it. And I'm glad to hear Brian but you say it's a lifetime commitment. Thank you. Thank you, Ernie. Uh, Ryan, will you testify for me? <laughs> okay, can, can we we can now go, go ahead, uh, Serge. All right, can we pull up the presentation again? Just... Uh, I think we had moved. Yes, we are on the slide. Thank you. So. Um, uh, one of the directors yesterday asked about uh, visual effects. Um, uh, we are introducing a, a change in the visual landscape for these communities as, as we pass through. So we have um, uh, design criteria and aesthetics criteria as mitigation and also uh, commitments to work with localities uh, so that we can uh, minimize the, the, the visual disturbance or the impacts as uh, of the project. So some of the sound barriers, there are um, uh, transparent sound barriers that can be included. Uh, we can have uh, architectural um, style elements included with some of the design, particularly where we may go through in a historic district. Uh, but we also, we work with the local communities to develop designs that are sensitive to the local context. So we can provide designs on the retaining walls or match the existing architecture. Um, and work with the local design criteria. And then additionally, uh, where we have uh, potentially retaining walls, we can include vegetative buffers or berms or also screen uh, the visual impact. So we have a suite of mitigation measures to, to reduce the visual effects. I see a question. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, I missed, Director Perea, did you have a question? Uh, or? He's, he's oh. got his thing on, go ahead, Serge. So, so we have a suite of mitigation measures where we can address uh, the potential visual effects of, of changing the landscape here. Can we move to the next slide, please? Uh, and so that concludes our presentation today for uh, addressing the issues that were, were brought to us during um, the public comment and the questions raised to us from the board yesterday. Thank you, Serge, for your presentation. Uh, uh, Director, or CEO Kelly, do you have any additional remarks? Uh, no, uh, Mr. Chairman, other than to just say, you know, we heard a lot of uh, issues yesterday. Uh, again, I just want to thank the team who was up really all night uh, uh, taking in those uh, comments and preparing uh, the presentation that you just heard. And I just want to express my gratitude to the uh, the team for the effort that uh, they're putting forth here to, to make sure that we are being as uh, informative as we can. So uh, thank you to Serge and Rick and Min Ming and Council and the, the entire team. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, do any of the board members have any que any additional questions for staff as they relate uh, to the information just provided? Okay, seeing none. No, I'm afraid uh, board member Bucci, please go ahead. Yes, I do. <laughs> Quite okay. a few actually. I'm sorry, so, Andrea, I didn't see you. No worries, no I'm worries. Um, uh, a couple of comments, first of all, uh, to begin with. Uh, uh, when we do, uh, you know, I'm, I'm putting my professional, ex-professional hat on, if you would, um, my engineering hat and 
uh, my previous history in developing transportation projects. When we prepare an environmental document, it is really to assess impacts and uh, put together a cost for the project that becomes <coughs> the basis for moving forward. Um, the design level at that point, it is, is about 35%. Sometimes we go even to 40, 45%, depending on the complexities of the project. Uh, there was a mention that the design level is appropriate here. I disagree with that from, from a professional standpoint. The design level of 15% may be good for a level one environmental document, a tier one, you know, the whole alignment from San Francisco to LA, but not when you're talking about uh, the sections that we're talking about. Those need to be developed to a point where we're comfortable with the impacts. We, we identify the impacts, we resolve uh, potential issues like railroad relocation or, or the issue with uh, Cal Portland or uh, some of the noise issues. Uh, I don't believe those issues have been resolved at this point. I, I see responses to comments, but I don't really see any resolution. We still have outstanding issues that need to be addressed. Biological uh, resources as well. I'm not. I'm not ignoring any of the issues that have really been brought out. There are a lot of issues that that we're making assumptions on and pushing to move forward with, but we haven't really resolved a lot of those. Um, those will impact not only the, the, the delivery of the project in terms of a schedule and commitments and things of that nature, but cost. Uh, we don't really have any idea of what the mitigation cost is going to be. Uh, we, don't, we have a suite of mitigation options, but really they're not specific. You know, there's a menu and yes, we can pull from them, but I don't believe those things have really been uh, brought into the equation. Um, you know, one thing, if, if there's anything to learn, I think we should learn from what's going on in the Central Valley. We put the contracts out at 15%, which is about the same level as here. And the next step would be to put the contract out um, oh. to, to, uh, to go forward. Uh, I think there are issues that we need to uh, really keep in mind as a lesson learned. Yes, you can develop designs for 35% beyond this point, but that's not really the point. The point is that when we have a project uh, cleared for environmental, then it should be cleared and all the issues are resolved. And I don't believe that resolution is in, in hand right now. I think what we're doing is deferring decision-making and deferring issue resolution and deferring cost determination and deferring uh, potential conflicts that will arise that will, you know, I hate to say the word, but, you know, uh, basically put us in a place where uh, we are right now in terms of, uh, cost overruns and schedule delays and, and burning of uh, budgets on, on the Central Valley projects. And I'm not being critical of anybody here. I'm just saying, you know, uh, we should really take a step back and start thinking about, you know, moving the remaining segments in a way where we, we are in control uh, a little bit more uh, than we were uh, when we were um, uh, putting together the first set of projects that are under construction right now. So. Um, that's kind of my, my overall assessment. I'll be more than happy to go into specific details, um, to lay out some of these. I think, I think the UPRR, uh, relocations, uh, in my opinion, should, uh, should be, uh, discussed and, and there should be some agreement with, with the railroad because, uh, if they don't let us move things around, then we don't really have an alignment that is, uh, that is fitting within the environmental document. And I think the Cal Portland issue is a huge issue. And I, I have concerns from a structural standpoint uh, as well, uh, uh, keeping that facility that close to blasting and, and whatever uh, other impacts the blasting and the seismic faults may generate for that. So um, those are on the table. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Yes, uh, CEO Kelly. If I just might make a couple of comments. First, I would say that one, uh, I've also been in transportation for the better part of 26 years. And I, it's, it's rare that any process when you're at the rod, whether you're at 30% or 15%, that you've solved all issues. Uh, that, that typically does not happen. And typically, uh, you know what you know at the time of the rod. I am for advancing uh, design further as quickly as we can. We're operating under a schedule that involves an agreement 
for getting this, this work done with our federal partner. Um, and we are moving forward uh, on that basis. Uh, that said, the other thing I just think that's missed in the analysis is that nobody is talking about, and this body and this management has been very clear that we're not going to construction contracts going forward until we've advanced the design well beyond uh, where we are today, uh, well past uh, uh, 15%, well past 30%. Uh, before we get into the next round of construction contracts. We've laid out a very detailed and methodical stage gate three process that has us advanced design to a level where we can map right away, understand utility relocations, and understand the third party agreements that are in front of us. That said, again, consistent with any rod, with where we are today, and what we know today, we are reflecting uh, uh, the fair depiction of what the project definition is, uh, what those impacts are, uh, and what our mitigation strategies are for those impacts. And again, like in almost any transportation project I could think of, typically there are things you resolve post rot. And there is no qu question and our resolutions before the board reflect that there are things we will need to solve as we advance design further. Part of advancing design further is also hopefully reducing our footprint as we go forward uh, versus all that's cleared here. So. There's a discipline to this. I agree with Andre completely on the discipline. And that is why we brought a stage gate three process into this. So we are not getting into the construction uh, elements uh, before we are much more advanced. But that some of that advancement can and often does happen post rot. And so uh, I just would make those comments to the board. And if I could just add on the UP issue, um, it is of course going to be complicated, but we can't really do agreements with entities pre-decisional and before this board has given the authority, the, the vote to go forward on this document and the alignment uh, chosen. And so if we start negotiating with folks ahead of your yeah. actions, we get into other legal problems. And so it, it's not mean, negotiate. Easy, it's, this is it's, the order. Yeah, it, I'm not I'm not really uh, asking you to develop an MOU. I think there should be some sort of a, uh, an agreement uh, at least verbal or otherwise, in terms of are they okay with it or are they not with you know okay with it? It it definitely impacts your location of your alignment. So you can't just go out and say I'm going to put it here. Period. There has to be some sort of a resolution, um, you know, even in the preliminary stages to see whether there are concerns, fatal flaws, uh, things that we can work out, and ultimately, yes, once you go into the the, the design process, then you can resolve those and develop your MOU and your contract to move forward with the construction. But, you know, um, I'm, I'm not new to this business. Uh, I've been in it before. I understand uh, the, the complications that you're talking about. Yes, you can't negotiate and you can't come up with agreements. And yes, you can't uh, do a lot of things, but I'm not really asking about uh, you know, having all these things penned and, and signed. I think there needs to be some assessment, some engineering assessments uh, that everybody can at least review and give you comments on. And I don't really see, uh, I've read the comments that the railroad has provided and I don't, I don't believe they're fully answered at this point. I would so, try to respond to that a little bit. Yeah, I, would, I, agree. I would say that we, you know, we have uh, shown uh, this concept to the Union Pacific uh, more than one occasion. We've briefed them on on what the plan is for this section. Um, yeah, it's very premature that they would not enter into an agreement of any kind at this point. They have not expressed that there's a fatal flaw that they see with this. They've not expressed really opposition to it. They generally just acknowledge that they understand what the concept is and we will have to negotiate this uh, post rod. Okay, thank you. For Alicia, for for the board, and certainly, and, and especially members who uh, don't have the level of experience, perhaps, in uh, environmental matters, as as uh, some of our other members do, can you and or your legal team with with uh, the our experts on on NEPA as well as uh, Dene on CEQA? Uh, can you give some guidance uh, and, and le comfort, let's say, to the board with regards to the documents that, uh, that are, have been presented or being presented uh, to us um, are consistent with 
generally accepted practices uh, with regards to environmental matters, both at the state and federal level, um, from which other boards like ourselves uh, act on a regular basis with regards to environmental certification of NEPA and, and CEQA. Uh, ab absolutely, Tom, and I'll certainly invite Min Ming or Danae to join, but um, the attorneys uh, involved in this project, both internal, both from the attorney general's office and uh, in this case of NEPA, private counsel uh, have spent months and months, years with this team developing this document, reviewing, commenting, ensuring its adequacy um, as part of the process and as part of the record. We have a legal sufficiency memo that is put together and provided uh, to the for the record in indicating all discussions and time spent uh, for legal counsel to ensure these documents meet all these requirements. Um, so we're very you know, confident we have met that standard, both NEPA and CEQA. Okay. Do any uh, any members have any additional comments uh, at this at this time? Uh, well, there's Danae. Danae, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I think Alicia. Thank you, uh, Tom. Danae Aitchison with the California Attorney General's Office. Um, Alicia, I think you stated that well, and I just wanted to be clear. And we can discuss more when we reach the next couple of agenda items that. Um, under CEQA, there isn't a particular dictate on the level of design. CEQA does not require advanced design. The key issue is having enough information to fully disclose the environmental impacts of the project. So we can talk about that further um, when we get to the next agenda items. Thanks, Danae. All right, thank you. I do have a quick question for Danae. Yes, please. Uh, Danae, um, real quick question. When the AG's office is, is taking a look at, uh, at documents like this, and you're, we've discussed a lot about the environmental impact issues, uh, what, what role does the AG's office play in this process? Thank you very much, Director, for that question. And, and let me be clear, um, the High Speed Rail Authority has its own legal counsel. Um, Alicia Fowler is with us, as is NEPA Council Min Ming Wu. And uh, to be fair, uh, this is a very, very large endeavor with all of these tier two environmental documents. And High Speed Rail has a long standing relationship uh, seeking assistance from my office um, with their compliance with environmental laws. So we are serving in an advice role. I'm, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Attorney General, Mr. Bonta, this is in my role as advisor to the High Speed Rail Authority. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Danae. Uh, Direct, uh, Vice Chair Miller. Um, am I off mute? I think I am. Yeah. Um, I just uh, wanted to thank staff for the presentation. I have a different uh, viewpoint than um, my um, esteemed colleague, Mr. Boutros, because I do think that in, in, in the environmental process, we need to, and you're required to, analyze as early as is reasonably possible in order to give the public just some information and knowledge and discuss impacts when we know, uh, when we know them. So that's always balanced with the idea that, you know, you're not at a construction level ever in, in the environmental process, you're at a planning level. And I do think that the um, efforts that we've taken are specific, they're understandable, they're also um, very uh, uh, definable at this stage. And, and as the AG said, there's not a requirement that you be at a certain design level in order to proceed. I, per I prefer proceeding earlier because I do think that it's important for the public to understand that there is an alignment that has been chosen. There's an alternative that we are looking at and um, that allows for us to do the adequate um, consultation and further specify mitigation measures because we have um, a, a proposed alignment. So I do not have a problem. I'm very happy for um, the Cal uh, Portland 
Samant, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, thank you for the information you provided today. I was concerned about the blast radius and I, I appreciate that you clarified that from our question that at least I had yesterday. I also thank you for the biological um, further and obviously the disadvantaged community and relocation. So I think that um, this, you know, we, we're not just on this process today. This has been a multi-year community resource and board um, information item. And I do believe that uh, we are at a place now that we have a very, very high level of knowledge of the impacts of this project going forward. And I'm satisfied. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Miller. Director Gilmetti. Yeah, um, I'd like to address maybe some of Andre's concerns. You know, obviously I think um, the current construction we're on now is a design build. Uh, project. Uh, I don't think anyone knew what the total costs were going to be. Um, and I would suggest going forward, and we're not there yet, that we go to a design bid build so we know exactly what our costs are going to be going forward. And I know that might be sometime in the future, um, but you know, we should have a better handle on our costs. There's no question about it. Um, so I, I think at this stage, we've, we've done enough with this environmental work to certify it going forward. Uh, on the Portland cement, uh, I am concerned as some of the others are about the blasting distance, whether it's 200, 600 feet. And if it has to go out to 600 feet uh, by some uh, 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 determining method, then it's a compensation issue. And you're gonna have to compensate the company for that loss of, of resources. So uh, again, I'd also like to say, I'm very pleased with hard work that our staff put in putting together this uh, environmental uh, document and, and I'm happy to move forward with it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gamati. Uh, Director Escusha. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to um, follow up on something that the uh, Deputy Attorney General, Ms. Atkinson had indicated. Um, and I was very furiously taking down notes, but I didn't, I was not fast enough, but let me just phrase my concern by way of a question to Ms. Atkinson. And that is that for CEQA and NEPA purposes, uh, what level of information do we need right now with regard to environmental impacts? I guess what's the bare minimum in order for this resolution to pass muster uh, under CEQA and NEPA requirements with regard to environmental impacts? Um, certainly. Thank you for the question. I will answer that um, for CEQA purposes and invite um, Authority Council uh, Min Ming Wu to answer for NEPA. But um, the CEQA guidelines are actually very helpful. These are the guidelines that the Office of Planning and Research adopts for purposes of helping CEQA lead agencies as the authority is comply with the law and prepare adequate EIRs. And so um, within the CEQA guidelines, section 15151 states an EIR should be prepared, and I'm quoting here, with a sufficient degree of analysis to provide decision makers, here that's you, with information which enables them to make a decision which intelligently takes account of environmental consequences. So that is the standard that the guidelines set forth um, and I was going to touch on this later, but I'm going to touch on it now. Um, it is clear from both the guidelines and case law interpreting the guidelines that under CEQA, perfection is not, a, is not the standard in an EIR. Um, the, the standard for an EIR is frequently described as adequacy, completeness, and a good faith effort at full disclosure. And so the function of this document is to inform the public and inform the decision-making body here, the board, of the environmental consequences. But it is, it is not required to be a scientific treatise. It is intended to be prepared um, as an informational document uh, that the average person can understand and read, um, supported by the technical data needed. Um, and uh, I will stop there on CEQA. Well, can I just ask a follow-up question on CEQA? Sure. Yes. If, if adequacy is a standard, and obviously it's adequacy as measured today, what happens uh, in the future if our adequacy of today turns out to be inadequate tomorrow? 
What are our remedies? What can we do? And that, that's an interesting question, and I'll, I'll try my best to answer your question. Um, within the CEQA process, um, once an environmental document is completed and a project is approved, the typical scenario is no more environmental review is, in, is required unless very specific circumstances occur. And those circumstances can be um, if there is a major change to the project or if there is a new significant impact that wasn't previously identified. When those things are arising, particularly in the context of a new discretionary decision, here the board will act or is proposed to act today, but you don't end your involvement with this project section. You will be actively involved in making decisions related to issuing an RFP, obtaining a contractor. Those are what in legal speak we call discretionary decisions. If at any point on that continuum circumstances change, the authority in its role as CEQA lead agency is obligated to, to sort of stop and check and determine if further environmental review is needed. So I, I hope that answers your question. For it really does, Counselor, and I really do appreciate you, the, the conciseness and clarity of your statement. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Do I see any other hands? Um, I do want to note uh, or have noted for the record that uh, uh, Director Assembly Member Juan Arambula has been with us uh, since almost the outset. Uh, also, it is um, before we move to the, the next item, which is starting the action items, it's 11.56. So we'll uh, break now for 10 minutes and uh, we'll pick back up. Mr. Chair, call. can I just make one point before we leave? Sure, please go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, you know, uh, there there is a difference between um, uh, the statement that says we need to be advanced in design versus um, having some of the issues resolved. I'm not really advocating that we prepare construction plans, nor am I advocating that we begin the design today so we can uh, answer these questions. I'm talking about some of the issues that are being identified here have not been sufficiently, to use the word, um, you know, from the code or adequately uh, vetted. That's my concern. And uh, if if we if we elect to move forward with this project, I just want to make sure that my concerns are clear. I'm not I'm not really asking anybody to develop a construction set of plans to go out uh, to construction and and responding to. Uh, Director Gilmetti's, uh, whether it's a design build or a design bid build, uh, this is the basis for the project. So this becomes the footprint for the project. This becomes the, the, the scope of the project. This becomes the budget base for the project. So if none of those are, uh, are uh, at least identified to a certain comfort level, then we, we have an issue moving forward. And that, I'll end there. And uh, uh, sorry to, to interrupt, uh, not, it's back not to you. Wrong. Not at all. Director Scusia, did you have another question? Well, my questions are basically going to be at the proper point, Mr. Chairman, when, when you tell uh, me. I just, I just noted your hand was up, so that's Oh, no, 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 no. I, I want to ask the details of the actual language in the resolution, but I guess that's, that's for later. Okay. All right. Fine. All right. Then uh, we will, it's, it's now noon, so we'll, uh, we'll step away for uh, 10 minutes and we'll, we'll, uh, be back in order. At uh, Tom, before we do that, what yes. is your best or Brian's best guesstimate of when we will be done for the day? I know it depends a lot on what we on the board say and do, but I, just to... It, it'll be difficult. Uh, the, the action items are before us, and then we also have a closed session. Um, I would... Well... I've got a thought, but Brian, I see your your screens on. Do you do you want to answer? I'm I'm going to say. I, I just I I'm sorry. I was, Tom, I was going to say when you come back from the break, you'll move to the likely move to the next sections on the yeah, agenda, that's what, yeah. and then there'll be conversation about the. It sounds like conversation about the content of the resolutions. Right. You'll resolve those, and then a vote and move forward. And then yes, there is a closed session uh, right. after that. So. So I, I don't know that, I don't think it would be two hours. I think it's possible that an hour and a half or so. 
Okay, that, thank you for that. I have a three o'clock that I okay. have to be at. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. We'll see you at 1210, everybody at 1210. So colleagues, uh, we're now going on, going to move on to three agenda items that involve board decisions. The first two agenda items, six and seven, involve board, the board and its role under the California Environmental Quality Act. And the third item, item eight, involves the board and its role under the National Environment or Environmental Policy Act. Since these are all board actions that have legal comp compliance elements to them, we'll have counsel assist us in walking through these one by one. So with that, uh, we'll, okay, I thought I saw a hand. With that, we'll turn uh, the proceedings over to uh, Chief Counsel Fowler. Thank you, Chair Richards. As the board knows, uh, we have the benefit of working some, with some subject matter expert uh, attorneys who are working incredibly hard on these projects. Um, we have two of them here today. I know you've been able to hear from them thus far and they're gonna spend a little more time with you on these important legal actions we're about to take. Um, Danae Atchison from the AG's office is gonna walk us through items six and seven of the agenda. And uh, Minming Rumori will walk us through item eight of the agenda. Um, you've had these materials, the documents we've been discussing, including the resolutions that we're about to spend more time with um, in your packet. You've also had a staff memo that we made every effort to make helpful uh, to explain the process and what's, what's going on. Um, and these materials have also been posted on the, the board's uh, website just to ensure the public can follow along. Um, we'll turn it over now uh, to Deputy Attorney General Danae Atchison so she can sort of walk you through your uh, the legal steps we're trying to take here today on item six and seven. Danae. Thanks, Alicia. Again, Danae Aitchison, and I'm gonna be addressing first agenda item six, which is considering resolution 21-05 to certify the adequacy of the document called the final EIR EIS for the Bakersfield to Palmdale project section under the California Environmental Quality Act. So the first step proposed here in resolution 21-05 is to certify the environmental document as adequate as an informational document. In order to move forward with a project approval, the board has to first make three specific certifications um, that are required under the California Environmental Quality Act. These are identified on page two of draft resolution 21-05 in your packet. And I'll briefly walk through them. The first certification is that the document has been completed in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act. The second is that the document has been presented to the board as the authority's decision-making body for this proposed project that the board has reviewed the environmental document and considered it prior to taking action. And third, that the final EIR EIS reflects the board's independent judgment. So as touched on earlier today um, by a board member question, you know, it is, it is a logical question to say, how do I know if this document has been completed in compliance with CEQA? I previously, uh, before the break, identified the guidance in the CEQA guidelines regarding an environmental document not needing to be perfect, but needing to be adequate, complete, and a full, excuse me, a good faith effort at full disclosure. Uh, the staff recommendation before you today is that this EIR EIS meets that standard. Um, as to the second certification, I'd just like to reiterate that staff have been provided with the four volume final EIR EIS concurrently with it being released to the public in late June. Um, that includes the responses to public comments in volume four. And you will be certifying today if you choose to approve this resolution that you have actually reviewed and considered it prior to taking action proposed in the next resolution. And Danae, finally, I could, Danae, I'm sorry if I could interrupt. I, I think um, 
when you said staff has received this these materials, um, you meant to indicate that the board has received. Uh, thank well. you, thank you, absolutely. The board received the, these materials as part of its packet um, in late June. Um, and then the third certification involves independent judgment. And in a nutshell, what that means is that the board is embracing the analysis in the final EIR EIS document as its own. Um, this isn't a process where the board as the decision-making body for this project defers to staff. The CEQA certification uh, in essence requires the board to adopt the analysis in the environmental document as its own. So I'm going to stop there. Um, the proposal before you today is to take action first on resolution 21-05, because it is a prerequisite to approving the project. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna stop. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions regarding resolution 21-05. Is that you, Henry? I can't see your video. No, okay. Uh, do any yeah, I'm, good. I'm good, Tom. Okay, thank you. Do any members uh, have questions for council with regards to uh, resolution 21-05? I see none. Uh, I see no questions, Danae. Um, with that, Chair, uh, you may proceed with uh, choosing to take action on resolution 21-05. Make a motion approved. Okay, we have a motion by uh, Director uh, Perea. Is there a second? I'll second. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry, was that? Lynn. Okay, thank you, uh, Director Shank. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, would the secretary please call the roll? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Director Shank? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Prea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Scutia? Yes. Director Butros? No. Director Williams? Aye. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries. Thank you. The next item is agenda item number seven. Ms. Ashton, can you please briefly walk the board through this item and the proposed resolution? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, resolution 21-05, certifying the final EIR EIS as adequate under the California Environmental Quality Act is an essential prerequisite to the board taking action, but certification on its own does not approve the project or the related documents required by state law. Um, having approved resolution 21-05, the board may now consider resolution 21-06 which would provide project approval for the Bakersfield to Palmdale preferred alternative in conjunction with related CEQA findings of fact, a statement of overriding considerations and a mitigation plan. And um, I will briefly walk through that with you now and provide an opportunity for discussion and asking questions. Resolution 21-06, which was in the board packet, and as Alicia noted, is posted on the authority's website, would involve the board approving a document um, attached to the proposed resolution called the CEQA Findings of Fact. That is a fairly hefty document. It's about 100 pages. It's required under the California Environmental Quality Act that in conjunction with decision-making, a CEQA lead agency must outline in detail, the significant impacts of the, pro excuse me, the project proposed for approval, the mitigation measures that are feasible to address those impacts, and to identify any remaining impacts that are not fully mitigated. The findings before you recount that the authority has essentially adopted all of the feasible mitigation measures identified in the document for significant adverse impacts. 
A second portion of resolution 21-06 involves the board adopting what is called a statement of overriding considerations. This is also part of exhibit A to your resolution. CEQA requires the board to explain to the public why the benefits of approving this project outweigh those significant environmental impacts that remain even with implementation of feasible mitigation measures. The statement of overriding considerations is part of the findings document, it's in exhibit A, and it outlines the staff proposed statement of overriding considerations for adoption by the board. And I would note that the staff presentation yesterday touched on many of these benefits. Um, they are outlined in detail in writing in the statement of overriding considerations. And I would note that they are structured to identify project benefits from the Bakersfield to Palmdale project section as part of the larger phase one system. Um, benefits associated with the opportunity of attaching the Bakersfield to Palmdale project section to the existing and underway construction in the Central Valley. And then particularized benefits associated with construction of the Bakersfield to Palmdale project section viewed on its own. Finally, resolution 21-06 would adopt what's called a mitigation monitoring and enforcement program. We talked earlier today about the decision-making process requiring the board to make a legal commitment to implement the mitigation measures identified. CEQA requires a monitoring plan. Um, these mitigation measures don't sit on a shelf. They're not pieces of paper. They're um, substantive legal commitments that the board will make with monitoring and reporting back to the board. Um, so that's, that's a nutshell of section one of your proposed resolution. Section two of that re resolution proposes approving the preferred alternative. Attached to the resolution is a map, and I just want to be very, very clear that the staff is proposing approval of the Bakersfield to Palmdale project section. The map, which is consistent with the map in the final EIR EIS, is identifying for you that this project section will traverse um, the area between immediately south of the already approved Bakersfield station to approximately one mile past the Palmdale station. Finally, um, there is a section three in the proposed resolution, and it includes a description of next steps. And I'd really like to emphasize this portion of the resolution. As part of these next steps, the board would direct staff to take a legal step, which is filing a notice of determination with the state clearinghouse. Um, that would be required. Portion B of section three, in the draft resolution involves proceeding with all necessary steps to essentially move the project forward. Section C directs staff to continue with outreach. We touched on this language earlier today and uh, Director Escutia questioned that, that two years. So this would be an appropriate time when I'm finished to, to discuss that language. Section D involves continuing outreach to stakeholders regarding wildlife protection and exploring options for advanced mitigation to the extent feasible. And finally, section E involves continuing to work in partnership with the local communities and other regional stakeholders. So the, the conclusion of the state CEQA process would be effectuated by the board's adoption of this resolution. Um, I understand there may be um, a desire to discuss the direction and next steps in section three, but um, before getting into that, I'd like to answer any uh, mechanical or procedural questions about the resolution generally. Director, if there are any. Director Williams, I, I see your hand up. I did. Sorry, I didn't have a question about. The procedure. I okay. just I once we get to the substance. Okay, fine. Thank you. Just about that. Yeah. Okay. If there are no questions about the procedure, I, I would like to turn it over to Alicia Fowler regarding 
the language. Um, I am participating remotely, and I think she has a better opportunity to help you in the event uh, members may wish to consider any changes to the resolution proposed language um, since I'm uh, many miles away. Absolutely. Alicia? Yes, um, so the resolution language um, is before you under uh, item or agenda item seven. Um, any sort of concerns, questions, discussion through the, the various subsections? Director Williams? Yep, I wanted to, first of all, I'm happy to defer to Director Escuta because I think she had a specific question about the time frame, which I, which is a concern that I share, or, or I can suggest maybe for her and the board's consideration, uh, adding language to C. Um, and actually, I should just back up and just say generally, I, I know this was said a lot yesterday, but this is an extraordinary amount of work that's been done by the staff. And I just want to repeat uh, how much we appreciate it. I think the vote on the first resolution is an indication of the confidence and the support that we have for what you've done, I think, and I hope that that will be the case with these next two. Um, and, uh, but I do have uh, two suggested, um, uh, edits to two suggested, to, to two provisions in, specifically in section three. And the first is picking up on Director Escutia's concern that we need, I think, more frequent and advanced notice of um, what measures are being taken to avoid um, the disproportionate effects related to the right-of-way acquisitions. Um, and so I would propose if, um, if this satisfies the director, director Scutia's concern too, because she, again, uh, she mentioned it first, that uh, in, this, in, in C, we say uh, to continue outreach to potentially affected communities and, and then I would insert as soon as practicable and that would be the insertion. Um, and then no later than um, twice annually. So uh, Director Williams, if I may, the language yeah. would be as soon as practicable, but not less than twice annually. Correct, correct. Okay, um, I accept that language. I think that language is good, you know, uh, but I also would like to hear from staff whether that's doable. You know, uh, uh, it, it says as soon as practicable, and I think practicable is the operative word. Uh, but obviously, I think what you're seeing here is that the intent of this language is that the board doesn't want to wait until two years before we get some information. So how does staff feel about that? Yeah. And, and can we finish? I just want to make sure I understand the language so staff is responding. So it would say, and as soon as practicable, but not less than twice annually, then where do you want to pick it back? Up? After after funding has been okay. approved. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Appreciate that. And, and um, Director Williams, I mean, I don't want to interrupt you on this item C, but if you have other language on item C, can you please let me let us know because I also have another language. No, that. I don't. I okay. don't. I just wanted to get at the timing. I think. Okay, I so think the we just yeah, we want to know when. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so timing. That's the issue on timing. One issue that I think is interesting that should be addressed is the line on item C one two three four line four. We're talking about. Um, to report on measures taken and measures proposed to avoid or address pro potential disproportionate effects, if any, related to property acquisitions in environmental justice communities. Does that include displaced businesses? Or, and if not, should we make a specific mention as to including, you know, any impact on displaced businesses? And again, I'm basically here piggy piggybacking on the comments made by Director Schenk. So if I may, so if I understand your question, um, your question is uh, for this particular direction of reporting back to the board on right-of-way acquisitions and its effect on environmental justice communities, um, 
does that include a requirement to report both on uh, right-of-way acquisitions for residential and business? And the answer is yes. So when you when you write when you describe environmental justice communities, you include you you are including residential and displaced businesses. That is correct. All right. Can, can can you write that down? Because I don't want to assume it. Uh, sure. It's actually written down in our EIR in the environmental justice chapter where we assess residential acquisition where we assess. Um, relocations and displacements for both residences and businesses. They are both defined as environmental justice in the environmental justice chapter of the final of the EIR. And obviously that chapter is being incorporated as an exhibit into this resolution. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. All right. I can live with that. That's okay. I think I wanted to just address two yeah. year the language we did have, um, just so we all understand and then staff can talk a little more about this proposed language, you know, that the two years after funding was felt right because there weren't gonna have been any displacements in that window of time. And we would be coming to you before displacements. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't come to you earlier. You know, I think as we move forward in those twice annually, I think that we'll get more and more and more info for you in, in board presentations, but we can start with what we know at the time. That's certainly fine. That's yeah, and as I've read it, Alicia, it's it it the report is on my measures taken or proposed. So if there aren't any, there wouldn't be a report, right? Okay. Yeah, right. Or yeah. please come forward and tell you that. Absolutely, yep. Director Shank. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, as yeah, yes, I won't believe it again, but yesterday and today, I think my my concerns have been um, addressed by by staff, the uh, Cal Cement the Wildlife, but. Primarily today, the, the housing displacement, the business displacement. And so I really thank directors William and Escudia for uh, putting their fine legal minds and their uh, ability to draft this in clear, concise, uh, almost irrefutable language. So thank you both for, for doing that. Um, it, it's a it has been is and will continue to be a real concern of, of mine, as I know it is for so many others on the board. Thank you, Director Shank. Any other questions or comments uh, by board members? I have one, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I'm sorry, go um, ahead. Yeah, and, and looking at item C again, to continue outreach, et cetera. I mean, I know we don't wanna be very or too prescriptive in it, but I, I just wanted to to ask staff uh, or get their thoughts in terms of consideration of issues that, that I raised. I mean, I think, yeah, continue outreach is great, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Uh, and I think considering the, the ethnic diversity of the communities uh, that we're dealing with, that we make not not a good faith effort, but I think it's absolutely necessary that we have folks on the ground that actually um, either have relationships uh, through the community with, with these different neighborhoods that can talk to them. Because I mean, you're gonna find just like we found in Fresno. And I think it's just a natural phenomenon. You know, people are very distrustful when the government comes and says, we're here to help. So, so I think the more that we can involve people from those communities, whether they be their elected leaders or, or an EDC in Baker, whoever the organizations are, that we do that. Now, I don't know if we need to be prescriptive, a little more prescriptive on this statement, or this is just staff direction. I'm, I'm looking for direction on that. Alicia? I mean, I, I, I think one option will be when staff comes back uh, twice annually with a little more information each time, it might be a perfect time for the board to give direction at that time where we'll all know a little bit more about uh, what, we're, what we're finding down in, uh, in the uh, Bakersfield to Palmdale area. I, I do think the language now with the changes uh, board members Williams and Escusia recommended cover what we need, but I think okay. your, your issue will probably be better covered almost as we come back to you with, with what's going on on the ground. Okay, so like the hiring of the, of the ombudsman, that won't happen for a couple of years, or is that going to happen now? Or we will need funding before that can happen. So we've got time. Got it. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other? Any I other? Would, yes. Yeah, 
or any other changes. So I think C, and I'm happy to read it back before we take a vote, but are there any other modifications to this resolution 2106 that we want to contemplate? Yeah, the, the second, if I'm if I might, Mr. Chair, is in is in uh, D. Um, and I'll try to do this in uh, I'm, I'm sorry, amendments. Director Williams, item D or E? D as in dog. Got it, got it. Yep. Um, so in the first line, after the word protection, I would propose inserting and potentially affected communities. And in the next line, after the word advances, I would propose inserting and the project is implemented. And the issue here, Mr. Chairman, is what we heard, I think we heard most articulately expressed by Brian, which is this section as currently drafted deals with essentially having an ongoing obligation to look at the feasibility of advanced mitigation with respect to wildlife protection. We think that ought to also apply to the communities that are impacted by the project and both from design through uh, operation. Thank you, uh, Director Williams. Can I read that? that I could, could I yeah. could read that back and yes. in, mm -hmm. in, in context, I guess. So it would, 3D would read, to continue outreach to interested stakeholders on wildlife protection and potentially affected communities as project design advances and the project is implemented and to explore the feasibility of advanced mitigation to the extent legally permissible. And. Perfect. That sounds good. Yeah. Uh, any any other uh, suggestions, questions or comments from board members? Hearing none, uh, we are ready to uh, Vote on as twenty one zero six. Motion approved. Twenty one zero. Twenty one. Yeah. All right. Do we have a motion? I'm sorry. Uh, do we have the motion for approval? No yeah, motion approved. Okay. Did the secretary get that? I don't know who said that actually. Henry and Anthony. Okay. Great. Henry. I'll and second. Anthony. All right. Second. Great. We got a motion and. Okay, and who's the second now then? Second. Okay, I'll thank you. Yeah. Bye, Henry. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, Secretary, please call the roll. So, Mr. Chairman, Director Shank? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Uh, Director Camacho, I think you're muted. Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Prea? Yes. Director Gilometti? Yes. Director Escutia? Yes. Director Butros? No. Director Williams? Aye. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries with the um, amendments. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, We will now move on to uh, agenda item number eight. Agenda uh, item number eight, uh, it, it involves the NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. So I will ask uh, Miming uh, Wu Mori to help us with this item. Thank you, Chair Richards. Good afternoon. Um, to you and to members of the board, I was perhaps remiss in not introducing myself earlier, so uh, I will take that opportunity now. Um, my name is Min Ming Mori, and I serve as Environmental Counsel in the Authority's Office of the Chief Counsel. Um, I am here today in my capacity as the Authority's NEPA Counsel to walk through Agenda Item 8, uh, which is the proposed record of decision for NEPA and related federal environmental laws. 
Agenda item eight provides the board with an opportunity to consider taking action on draft resolution 21-07, which is in your board materials. This resolution is proposed pursuant to, uh, as you know, the authority's role as NEPA's lead agency, a role as, as NEPA lead agency, a role assigned to the authority by the Federal Railroad Administration in 2019. In this role, the board is asked to consider whether to approve- Your relationship? Is it simple to- I think, okay. In this role, in this role, the board is asked to consider whether to approve the draft NEPA Record of Decision or ROD. And if adopted, resolution number 2107 directs the authority CEO to sign and issue the draft Record of Decision. A copy of this draft is in your board materials. I will also touch on some of the changes that we made uh, just now as well. Um, as you deliberate on whether to approve this resolution, un note that under NEPA, a record of decision um, must state the proposed decision here, approval of the preferred alternative that uh, under CEQA. The record of decision must also state alternatives considered, alternatives one, three, four, five, um, and the CCNM design option and the refined CCNM design option as described by the staff. Um, in the earlier presentation. The record of decision must also state the environmentally preferable alternative. It, it states that the environmentally preferable alternative um, as found by the EIS is the preferred alternative. Um, the record of decision must also certify consideration of public comments. Um, you have all received the public comments, both in the final EIS, as well as receipt of all public comments that we have received. Um, leading up to the board meeting. It must state practicable mitigation measures. That is an attachment to this resolution and to the ROD, which is a mitigation monitoring and enforcement plan, which the authority um, will adopt uh, if this resolution is approved. And then finally, it must state factors considered by the lead agency in its decision. Um, and it does state some of the factors that were discussed uh, by the state, uh, by the by staff in their presentation. Finally, the ROD has to include findings related to the environmental documents compliance with other related federal environmental laws uh, related to the protection of parks and recreational resources, section 4F, the DOT Transportation Act of 1966, related to the protection of wetlands, environmental justice, and floodplains, all covered by uh, Department of Transportation orders, and related to the project's uh, compliance and findings required under the Clean Air Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, and the Endangered Species Act. As stated in a board briefing memorandum, um, the Office of the Chief Counsel has reviewed the draft record of decision and advises that the draft is legally sufficient with respect to these requirements. So finally, uh, the, the draft resolution also directs the CEO um, to, and we have just discussed this in the CEQA resolutions, to continue outreach to potentially affected communities um, in the context of right-of-way acquisition and report back to the board. Uh, uh, you may, of course, ask that uh, conforming edits uh, be uh, made to this resolution that were just approved in the CEQA resolution um, for uh, the the for this particular direction. The same is true for the direction regarding wildlife stakeholders um, and um, conforming edits with respect to affected communities um, and continued reporting um, and outreach during project implementation. So that is a summary of uh, the direction of um, the resolution if approved by the board. Um, with that summary, um, this is the last and final Bakersfield Upon Mill resolution and an opportunity for, for the board to ask any questions regarding the procedure or make any final comments. Tom, you're muted. Thank you. Uh, any questions from members of the board? All right, uh, hearing none. Would uh, anyone like to make a motion uh, on 
Resolution H HSRA 21-77. So moved. And I direct Vice Chair yep. Miller. And I would second, and just to clarify that that is uh, as modified by the yeah. previous by resolution. the language in 06. Uh -huh. Correct. Okay. okay. We will, yes, we will modify the language in, in, in yes. thank, 07 thank as you. we did thank in 06. You, okay, as modified. Okay, we have a motion by Vice Chair Miller. Was there a second? Yeah, that was my second. Oh. Okay, I'm sorry, Director Williams. A motion and second. Uh, uh, Secretary, please read the roll. Director Shin? Yes. Chair Richards? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Vice Chair Miller? Yes. Director Prea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Yes. Director Escutia? Yes. Director Boutros? No. Director Williams? Aye. Mr. Chairman, the motion carries as modified. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, and thank you, members uh, of the board. Um, it may not seem like it, but I, I think it is clearly no small milestone for this project. Um, and for those uh, serving it today and those who have in the past. And for frankly, for all Californians. It, its success is tied to the completion of a statewide alignment connecting some 85% of us Californians from the population and economic centers of Southern California to Northern California through the Central Valley. It's not so dissimilar in many ways to what President Abraham Lincoln did in the early 1860s with the Transcontinental Railroad moving from Nebraska to California. And its importance, I think, to California over the next centuries will be felt as was the passenger rail and freight rail system that President uh, Lincoln proposed and then saw his way through to get it done. For us on the board, um, it opens uh, the importance of another major task that we have, and that is working with the governor, the legislature, its leaders, the Congress and the administration to help all of us find the money to fund the vision, uh, which is the future of surface transportation with rail and a major adjunct to what how Californians get around the state of California. So with that, um, I when you work as hard as you all have, the, the staff has for on this day for the last 11 years, sometimes it's um, a relief and other times it's a time for joy. I'm not sure that we're feeling the time for joy, but uh, I would say in the days ahead of us, there's every reason to feel the joy and to uh, work as hard on the future as we have on the past, because that is truly the future for California's high-speed rail train system and the importance of it to all of us in California. And as the leader, uh, for this uh, technology across the United States. So with that, let me uh, thank you and, and in my way, congratulate you and thank you for all of the effort um, and sincere um, care that you, that you exercise, not only today, but in every, every way that I have seen in my interaction with each and every one of you. I'm very, very proud as I said yesterday, and I mean it very sincerely, to serve with you. Uh, CEO Kelly. Well, Mr. Chairman, thank you. I just uh, want to take a minute to, again, acknowledge the hard work of the staff. These are rigorous two-day hearings for, for all of us. Certainly for the board members, there's a lot of information to digest, a lot of things to go through. And uh, I think you can imagine uh, the uh, sometimes the pressure on the staff to uh, develop all that information to get the briefings prepared and to 
you know, uh, uh, be able to communicate with all of you in this setting in a way that's clear and concise on extremely complex uh, information. So I just want to acknowledge the great work of the staff. I'm extraordinarily proud of them. And just uh, a message from me to the board. I know there are uh, often differences on certain elements of this project that is not easy anywhere. Um, but it is sure nice from my perspective to see the uh, collective uh, coming together of the board on certain things that we think are important and you all think are important as Californians and uh, the ethic of this agency and this authority for how we do business going forward. And so I just, I was heartened uh, to see uh, the board really coming together around these important issues of how, not just what we do, but how we do it. And uh, the commitment of this management team is to execute it uh, just the way the board uh, determined and directed us to do so. So I just want to acknowledge that and say thank you. And I'm awfully proud to work for this board. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, CEO Kelly. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that, uh, that concludes the open portion of our two-day meeting. Uh, the board still has additional work in closed session. So we will go to closed session now. And uh, upon the uh, conclusion, oh. yes, uh-huh. Um, before we do that, there's a big important thank you that was missed. Oh. Uh, that is a thank you to you oh. for your leadership, for your patience, for your civility, uh, for your calm demeanor in uh, knitting all of this together. So I know I speak for everyone on this one when I say thank you to you too. Oh. Thank you, you're very kind, I appreciate that. Um, so as I mentioned, we'll go to closed session. After the closed session, I will come back and uh, uh, report whether uh, there is any, uh, whether there was any action in closed se session taken by the board. So for this and for two very tired guys who I see on the screen, um, <laughs> Serge and Rick, uh, you uh, you were way above and beyond, and thank you very very much. It's uh, it is it's an amazing feat. I know that you're the faces of it, but there are um, what uh, how many how many today? I'm, my mind is weak. <laughs> over 200, 200 people behind you, and they're probably already on the floor. So thank you, again. <laughs> thank you again, everybody, and uh, the. The open session is now going to close session. I'll be back uh, shortly with the report. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the uh, California High Speed Rail Authority's Board of Directors has completed its closed session, uh, has nothing to report. And uh, we wanna thank you all again for being with us. Uh, for those of you who are with us yesterday and today, the uh, board meeting for the month of August is now adjourned. And, have a good uh, balance this summer. We'll look forward to seeing you uh, next month. And meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>